public session. Uh, I would just want to um, remind members and also viewers that we're in public session and um, I would ask you to turn your phones on to flight mode or to switch them off as they interfere with the um, broadcasting and recording services. I'd like to extend on behalf of the committee a warm welcome to John McCarthy, Secretary General of the Department of Housing, Planning and Local Government, Mary Hurley, Assistant Secretary, Social Housing Division General, uh, Paul Hogan, Senior Advisor, Planning, Sean Armstrong, Senior Advisor, Building Standards, Sarah Neary, Prin Principal Advisor, Housing Advisors and Building Standards, and finally Martin Hare, um, Department of, of Housing, Planning and Local Government. So before we begin Again, the formal uh, proceedings. I just need to call, to call uh, advisor witnesses on the matter of privilege. So I wish to advise the witnesses that by virtue of Section 17.2.1 of the Defamation Act 2009, witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect of their evidence to this committee. If you're directed by the committee to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter and you continue to do so, you're entitled thereafter only to a qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. You're directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given and you're asked to respect the parliamentary practice to the effect that where possible you should not criticise or make charges against any persons or entity by name or in such a way as to make him, her or it identifiable. Finally, members are reminded of the long-standing ruling of the Chair to the effect that members should not comment on, criticise or make charges against a person outside the House or an official by name or in such ways to make him or her identifiable. I will now call on Mr McCarthy to give an opening statement. Thank you, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, good afternoon, uh, 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 Chair and members. And thank you for the opportunity to, to come to the committee today to address you on issues within our area of responsibility. I know that you've had a number of uh, interesting uh, contributions and sessions to date, um, and those have raised a number of issues that fall within the, uh, the Department's remit, so I hope to be, we'll be able to address as many of these as possible today. Just to kick off at the outset, uh, Chair, I'd like to say a few words about Project Ireland 2040, uh, which the Government launched earlier this year. Uh, Project Ireland 2040 is the overarching planning and investment framework for the social, economic and cultural development of our country. Uh, it includes a detailed capital investment plan for the period 2018 to 2027. Uh, that's the 116 billion National Development Plan, or NDP, in support of a long-term transformational spatial strategy, the National Planning Framework, or NPF, which has a time horizon out to 2040. The aligned and shared vision of the NPF in tandem with the NDP represents a joined-up planning and investment strategy for Ireland's future growth and development, focused on a series of ten shared national outcomes. Foremost amongst these is climate action and the national objective to transition to a low-carbon and climate-resilient society by 2050. Policy that will assist in making that transition and meeting our climate obligations is woven through the MPF and NDP. Shared outcomes reflected in both documents that are fundamentally supportive of climate action include compact growth, sustainable mobility and sustainable management of water, waste and other environmental resources. All include significant elements of policy that provide a strong platform for the development of measures and actions in response to climate change. The overall NPF strategy seeks to achieve a better balance of development between the regions a greater focus on Ireland's cities, supporting Ireland's rural fabric and targeting more compact growth in the development of settlements of all sizes from the largest city to the smallest village. The benefits of compact growth are that it can bring new life and footfall to the cores of our cities, towns and villages, contribute to the viability of services, shops and public transport, add to housing supply and enable more people to be closer to employment and recreational opportunities, as well as to walk or cycle more and use the car less. Along with minimising transport demand, higher densities and shorter travel distances will also reduce energy demand and use. Multi-storey and terraced buildings in close proximity require less energy and make renewable-based systems of energy distribution, such as district heating, more feasible. The EU circular economy package indicates that in a circular economy, a cascading use of renewable resources should be encouraged, together with its innovative potential for new materials, chemicals and processes. 
This circular economy approach is also applicable to land use management. Through compact growth, the NPF effectively sets out recycling rates for the reuse of brownfield land by requiring 40% of new housing nationally to be built within infill and brownfield lands and encourages reuse of existing building stock. The extent to which we prioritise compact growth, brownfield over greenfield use, encourage the use and reuse of buildings in urban and rural areas and reduce sprawl will assist us in increasing the efficiency of land use and contribute to meeting emissions reduction targets. The NPF identifies the need to progressively electrify our mobility systems, moving away from carbon intensive propulsion systems to new technologies such as electric vehicles and the introduction of electric and hybrid traction systems for public transport fleets such that by 2040 our cities and towns will enjoy a cleaner, quieter environment, freer of combustion engine driven transport systems. The NPF also supports transition to a circular bioeconomy, where the value of bio-based products, materials and resources is maintained in the economy for as long as possible and the generation of waste minimised. Central to the NPF is a recognition of the need for energy efficiency and for new energy systems and transmission grids that will, under, that will underpin a more distributed, renewables-focused energy generation system. This will provide a basis for harnessing both the considerable onshore and offshore potential from a range of energy sources, such as wind, wave and solar, and connecting the richest sources of that energy to the major sources of demand. In particular, the NPF states that the development of offshore renewable energy is critically dependent on the development of enabling infrastructure to bring the energy ashore and to connect into where it is needed most. The Department is currently undertaking a review of the 2006 Wind Energy Development Guidelines. This review is addressing a number of key aspects including sound or noise, visual amenity setback distances, shadow flicker, community obligation, community dividend and grid connections. As part of this work, a strategic environmental assessment is being undertaken in accordance with the requirements of EU Directive 2001-24-EC on the assessment of the effects of certain plans and programmes on the environment, otherwise known as the SEA Directive. It is expected that a public consultation on the revised draft guidelines, together with the comprehensive environmental report under the SEA process, will be commenced in the coming weeks, with the aim of issuing the finalised guidelines following detailed analysis and consideration of the submissions and views received during the consultation phase in early 2019. When finalised, the revised guidelines will be issued under Section 28 of the Planning and Development Act 2000 as amended. The Department, in collaboration with the Department of Communications, Climate Action and the Environment, who lead on renewable energy policy, is also exploring the potential for enhancing national planning guidance on solar energy. Taking account of solar energy projects being assessed by planning authorities and the scope for future development of the sector in the context of the ongoing development of renewable energy policy. Further to this ongoing engagement between the two departments, should the need for specific planning guidance for solar farms be identified, this work will be further scoped and progressed. The NPF highlights the role that Ireland's forests and peatlands can play in climate change mitigation through carbon sequestration and the provision of renewable fuels and raw materials. Irish forestry is a major carbon sink and deforestation is the most significant mitigation option that is available in terms of land use. In terms of climate adaptation, the NPF makes it clear that as an island, it is in our interest to ensure we respond to climate change and its impacts such as sea level change more frequent and sustained rainfall events and greater vulnerability of low-lying areas to flooding. In particular, the NPF makes it clear that in planning for future development, flood risk assessment is now critical due to rising sea levels. In the long term, climate change adaptation responses may entail the consideration of barrage or similar technologies to prevent inundation of lower-lying city centre areas during extreme weather events. Therefore, in summary, in order to con contribute to achieving transition to a low-carbon, climate-resilient society, the NPF provides a strategic framework to link planning, development and investment to climate mitigation and ad adaptation through influencing transformational change in the pattern of development and settlement by securing more compact growth, supporting resource efficiency in the circular economy, facilitating greater energy efficiency, the development of renewable energy systems and infrastructure and a more diverse energy mix, 
and ensuring that mitigation and adaptation measures are embedded in the operation of the planning system. It's important to note that the NPF is a national strategy which integrates a range of cross-cutting objectives. And implementation of the NPF will require shared responsibility with lead roles across many different government departments and agencies. In terms of future investment, the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform is currently reviewing all the technical factors relevant to the appraisal of capital schemes. This will include changes to the Public Spending Code with regard to methodologies for the evaluation of the likely costs of carbon emissions and the likely benefits of climate change mitigation. We understand that this work is expected to be published within the, within the coming weeks and will include a period of public consultation. The principal measures proposed include new methodologies with the, with the potential to impact on prioritise project prioritisation. At this stage, Chair, I might turn from the NPF to the issue of the building sector specifically. In Ireland, approximately 40% of total energy produced is used in the building sector. The Energy Performance of Buildings Directive sets ambitious goals for energy efficiency and renewables in buildings by requiring nearly zero energy building, or NZEB, performance for new buildings from the 31st of December 2020. In addition, the Directive also requires that major renovations to existing buildings are completed to a cost-optimal level where this is feasible. The implementation of NZEB is a key action for the built environment in contributing to Ireland's national low carbon transition and mitigation plan. I will focus first on what we are doing to achieve NZEB in new dwellings. We have progressively updated standards relating to the conservation of fuel and energy in dwellings over the last decade, with the aim of improving the energy and carbon dioxide emissions performance of all new dwellings to NZEB performance levels. Because of this, the final step on the INZEB journey is not as significant as it might otherwise be. Many of the techniques introduced in 2007, such as mandatory renewables for new dwellings and more, efficient, uh, more energy efficient boilers, have effectively eased the transition and minimised the additional costs and effort required at this stage to achieve the INZEB performance for dwellings. We will shortly be publishing an update to Part L of the building regulations to achieve these NZEB performance requirements in dwellings. When implemented, it will represent an improvement of 70% in energy and carbon dioxide emissions performance over 2005 standards for all new dwellings commencing construction in 2019, subject to the necessary transitional arrangements. A modelling and cost study was carried out to estimate the cost impact of NZEB. And when the uplifting cost was calculated for a range of common heating systems, renewables and ventilation systems, for typical new dwellings to achieve NZEB, the range was 0.7% to 4.2% over current construction costs, depending on the dwelling types and design specification applied. The average uplifting cost across all dwelling types modelled was 1.9%. When compared with the energy savings to the occupants over the lifetime of the house, this delivers real value, benefiting, benefiting people's lives by bringing comfort and convenience, mitigating against energy poverty and in health, as well as providing the societal benefits of lower carbon emissions. Under the current regulations, a typical new dwelling is built to an A3 building energy rating. The INZEB requirements will equate to an A2 BER. As I said earlier, this represents a 70% improvement in energy efficiency and a 70% reduction in CO2 emissions compared to 2005, and also introduces 20% renewables as a percentage of the total building energy use. The INZEB requirements make it more attractive for builders and homeowners to further incorporate renewable technologies and move away from traditional fossil fuels. The Central Statistics Office analysis of building energy rating data demonstrates this shift away from fossil fuels. The installation of oil boilers has dropped from 36% to 6% in new dwellings, and electrical systems make up 35% of heating systems in new dwellings, with the, this percentage growing steadily each year. Partel regulation is set at cost-optimal levels. It is performance-based and is technology neutral. The availability of a choice of different energy systems delivers economic benefits, including competition and choice for consumers. It is a matter for the designer to choose the most suitable technologies to achieve the required performance. The cost-optimal calculations are reviewed every five years, and regulations will be amended if performance levels deviate off cost-optimal. This regular assessment and flexibility provides opportunities to capture the benefits of innovation and economies developed in industry over time in regulations. 
is estimated that the cumulative improvements to regulations will mean that a dwelling built to the 2011 Part L regulations requires 90% less energy than the equivalent dwelling built in 1978 to deliver the same standards of heat, hot water and light. This shows the very significant progress that has already been made in the standards for new buildings. In relation to existing buildings, the challenge is inevitably more difficult. The Energy Performance of Buildings Directive requires that where buildings are undergoing major renovation, the whole building should be brought up to a cost optimal level, insofar as this is technically, functionally and economically feasible. The cost optimal level performance is the best energy performance that can be achieved in a building for the lowest lifetime cost when both capital costs and operating costs are accounted for over a 30 year period. Our technical guidance documents provide detailed guidance on how this can be achieved in practice for buildings undergoing a major renovation. The performance levels have been set to be proportionate to the original cost of works and ambitious but realistic so as not to create an unintended barrier to renovation. Of course, building regulations will not increase renovation rates in themselves, but they will ensure that when renovations are carried out, that they are carried out to this level which will be a typically equivalent to a B2 energy rating. In relation to social housing, funding of some €116 million Euros has been provided from 2013 to the end of last year to improve energy efficiency and comfort levels in almost 64,000 local authority homes. In addition, energy efficient measures have been incorporated into the 9,000 plus vacant social housing units that have been returned to productive use since 2014. This effectively means that approximately 50% of our social housing stock has been energy retrofitted. While energy efficiency activity has traditionally been focused on the refurbishment of vacant properties, the current energy retrofitting programme launched in 2013 was aimed more broadly at the social housing stock, in particular to improve the energy efficiency of older apartments and houses by reducing heat loss through the fabric of the building in order to improve comfort levels and address issues around food po f fuel poverty. Excuse me. This programme has two phases. Phase one has focused on the lower cost improvements such as cavity wall and attic insulation. And phase two, which we will shortly be moving on to, is now targeting higher cost measures, for example fabric upgrades and glazing, etc. Turning to buildings other than dwellings, NZEB and the requirements for major renovations were introduced for non-residential buildings in November 2017 through an amendment to Part L of the building regulations. These new performance requirements improve the energy performance in the order of 60% and introduce mandatory renewables on all new non-residential buildings. These regulations apply to works to new and existing buildings which commence after the 1st of January 2019, subject to transition arrangements. In advance of publication, we went through an extensive public consultation process and reg regulatory impact assessment in early 2017. And as part of that, we worked closely with the Department of Education and Skills, the Office of Public Works and the Health Service bodies, as well as many construction industry bodies, in order to de develop, elaborate and introduce the regulations and guidance. A new element of the revised Energy Performance of Buildings Directive is the provision of infrastructure for charging of electric vehicles. Lack of, re of recharging infrastructure is seen as a barrier to the take-up of electric vehicles in the EU and the revised EPBD has new provisions which aim to accelerate deployment. The EPBD requires the provision of appropriate enabling infrastructure for all new buildings and buildings undergoing major renovation with more than 10 car parking spaces by 2020. And in addition, the installation of the actual recharging point is required in the case of those non-residential buildings. By 2025, it requires the installation of a minimum number of recharging points for existing non-residential buildings with more than 20 parking spaces. We are in the process of drafting these regulations and we will be publishing them for public consultation in 2019. We are consulting with the Commission for Regulation of Utilities and the National Standards Authority of Ireland in this process and will have the regulations in place by March 2020. In conclusion, Chair, the Department will continue to work hard on all of the measures I've outlined, notwithstanding the other challenges that we face in terms of building up our national housing stock. We have ambitious targets in terms of the quantity, type and location of homes to be delivered, and we are also ambitious for climate action. We will ensure that the quality of the homes we are building for future generations continues to achieve the high standards we are setting for decarbonising our built environment. And um, obviously myself and my colleagues will be happy to address any questions that the committee may have.
Thank you very much. much. Thank you. Um, I might start with a few questions myself, if you would want to just take note of them. Um, we're soon going to be, as a committee, visiting the Tipperary Energy Agency. And I'd just like to ask your department uh, what you have done to encourage other local authorities to follow suit and take similar actions as taken by the Tipperary Energy Agency. Also, you're, you refer to um, heating systems, and we welcome the move away from fossil fuel heating systems um, to more uh, energy efficient um, heating. But what will Part L of the, of the building um, regulations provide in respect of future proofing? Um, our heating systems, particularly in relation to new homes that are now being built, um, the likelihood of them having to be retrofitted in the upcoming years in order to meet new standards. And also in relation to deep retrofitting, it has limited scope at the moment. Um, and just what are your plans in relation to um, expanding on that? Also, um, in relation to non-resident buildings like schools and hospitals, we were told here in our committee a number of weeks ago um, that new schools built today, um, that the Department of Education and Skills have provided that the most suitable uh, heating system is oil. And that's under the technical guidance document 33, which was only issued by the department this year. So with that in mind, do you feel that that document is misguided, knowing where you know, the targets that we have to achieve? And if oil heating is being recommended by the Department of Education, they feel that's the most suitable um, f form of heating within schools. And also, um, in relation to the... Um, the delay in the foreshore amendment legislation, um, can you just say why that legislation is, is delayed and what is needed to develop our offshore wind electricity generation capacity? If you could just deal with those few issues before I bring in other members. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, uh, a number of the issues that, you, uh, that you've raised, Chair, are, uh, I suppose, related to, to, to energy policy and, and, and particularly in terms of, uh, of deep retrofitting, but let me just take them to the extent that, that I can. The Tipperary, Tipperary Energy Agency, um, uh, the Department of Communications, Climate Action and Energy would, uh, would take the lead role in terms of, I suppose, rolling out a, um, a local government capacity in terms, of, uh, in terms of functions such as those that the, the Tipperary Energy Agency discussed charges. Um, I suppose at a broader level, obviously, we have um, sort of macro level responsibility for the local government sector, albeit that other departments take the lead on particular issues. So we would certainly, at a, at a very broad level, we would certainly, uh, and it's reflected in the, in the policy um, document on local government reform published back in 2014, we certainly see local government expanding its, its role in terms of, if you like, community, uh, community development uh, and local development, which would encompass things such as uh, local energy initiatives of this kind. But the actual energy, the specific energy related dimension to it is something that the Department of uh, Communications, I'll, I'll call them decay if that's okay, because rather than, I, I suspect I'll probably have to refer to them a few times, and it is a bit of a, a, bit of a mouthful that that, that, that department would, would lead on uh, in terms of engagement within individual local authorities. In terms of uh, Part L and the, the, the requirements, as it was in terms of the requirements for new uh, residential um, uh, developments, we're, uh, we've, as I outlined at the, at the outset, we've come a long way in terms of the, uh, the journey towards uh, nearly zero energy uh, buildings as far as the residential sector is concerned through changes that were made um, back uh, almost, in fact, even more than 10 years ago at this stage. Um, so we're very much guided by NZEB and what that, requires, uh, what that requires us to do uh, in order to complete that journey. So we are at a very advanced stage and we'll, we'll be finalising shortly the, uh, the new Part L provisions that will bring us or provide for us to get that remaining part of the, of the way along towards NZEB. Um, and that will deal with both new homes but also deal with the issue of, uh, of retrofitting. Um, I might ask one of my colleagues maybe just to, to say a little bit more in relation to, uh, in relation to that in a, in a minute. Um, in terms of the, the approach uh, that the, uh, the, the building regulations are based on, um, I would have mentioned in my opening statement that the building regulations uh, are and have, have always been performance-based. Um, and 
so they, they set in effect the standards that are to be are to be achieved and it is then left to the, the designers and the, the promoters of, of developments to work out what is the best technology from their point of view to, uh, uh, to achieve that. And I suppose the, the, the impact of the, the regulations and the changes that were made um, back in 2007 and subsequently, we can trace that that performance-based approach has led, to, uh, has led to significant change. And that's the, that performance-based approach is what will be reflected in the revised Part L regulations when they're, uh, when they're made shortly. Um, in terms of offshore energy, the, the policy in that is, is for decay, but I think your question was more in relation to the, the, the legislation. Uh, that is a, a complex piece of legislation which has been, uh, uh, we've been working on in, uh, in collaboration with a number of other departments for a long period of, uh, a long period of time. Where things stand at the moment is we are currently awaiting legal advice from the Attorney General's office. Uh, we expect to get that shortly. Um, how quickly we will then be able to bring the legislation forward is really going to be dependent on what that legal advice, uh, what that legal advice actually uh, tells us. But we are very alive to the fact that that piece of legislation is hugely important in terms of ensuring that there is an appropriate consent regime in place for uh, the um, expected development of offshore renewable energy that um, that uh, we, we expect to see over the coming years. Maybe if I could just ask my colleague Sarah, maybe just to say a few words on the the, the approach uh, in the uh, building regulations, particularly in relation to the performance-based approach. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, so as John has said, the building regulations are performance based, so it's around the energy efficiency and the CO2 emissions. So we're technology neutral in terms of, of setting the standards. Um, and then it's up to individual designers, whether it's public buildings or uh, private individual designers choosing the heating system that's most suitable for or the overall compliance, but heating system being one element of that. Um, in terms of setting the performance requirements in the building regulations, uh, it's done through uh, the process of analysing uh, cost optimal. And that's basically, as John has explained, it's a life cycle cost taking into account the capital costs and the operational costs over a 30-year period. And there's uh, uh, Sean Armstrong here now would be involved in, in developing up, uh, in, in producing those cost optimal figures on a five-yearly basis. Um, and they show um, in, in cost optimal curves at what point that our regulations should be set at. And currently, uh, where they're set would allow uh, a number of different forms of heating system to be used, um, for example, gas boilers and uh, photovoltaic solar solar panels or heat pumps, and they would both achieve the uh, the required uh, CO2 emissions and the energy performance that's required under Part L, because they take into account uh, cost uh, uh, costs over both the capital and the operational period. Um, that is, that's important from the point of view of delivering houses and delivering the volume that we need at the moment. So it's important to keep a, um, a broad supply chain uh, available to the delivery, particularly of houses and, and other buildings. So costs, uh, capital and operational costs, as opposed to the carbon emissions, it's, it's, is it, are you saying the balance because well, it, both it could systems. be too costly to have a more energy efficient um, heating system, is that the dilemma? So the, the, um, so the, the, the systems achieve the same CO2 emissions, so they both achieve the same CO2 emissions. Sorry, oil um, heating systems and? Uh, so oil heating systems are, uh, I mean the requirement is to, to th there are a number of ways of achieving the overall performance uh, and in some cases oil systems can be used. I suppose the CSO figures show that there is a, a significant decline in the use of oil burners. Oil boilers from 36% to 6% in new dwellings um, and a significant increase in uh, electric heating. So we can see the industry is, is shifting uh, anyway uh, on foot of the regulations and where they're going. And I suppose the cost optimal five-yearly five review gives that opportunity for uh, recognition of the changes within industry to be captured then in the regulations. So that five-yearly review of both the economic and environmental aspects is incorporated then into building regulations each time because if we if we deviate if our regulations deviate off that uh, cost optimal 
uh, section of the curve, then we have to revise our building regulations, and that's all set out in the EPBD. Does the, the, the Climate Change Advisory Council has said that Irish homes are using 7% more energy than the European average, but they're responsible for 58% more carbon emissions. I suppose this was what I'm, I'm taking from what you're saying there is it is the cost, the cost is coming into this in relation to the choices that are made in our public buildings or, or deep retrofit. Is that, am I interpreting, am I interpreting what you're saying correctly? So, I suppose the, these are, these are European rules, I suppose, that are set in terms of, 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 of setting building regulations or building codes. So that's the, uh, that's the requirement at European level to take both factors into account. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm not familiar with the, uh, statistics that you've mentioned there, but I'm not They're sure from if that's... the Ch Climate Change Advisory Council, that's um, their report. But whether th that may be taking into account uh, broader use rather than just, uh, that, uh, just what's accounted for under building regulations. So it might be consumer use of products and that. I'm not specifically aware, Sean, I don't know if yeah, you're... I think, I think the figures from the Climate Change Advisory Council include existing buildings and we're talking about new buildings, the performance requirements for new buildings. So when you look at uh, you did the full housing stock in Ireland, um, you, the Climate Change uh, Advisory. Advisory Council made that conclusion. But at the moment we're talking about new buildings. Um, I think one of the really important things, uh, points to make about new, bu new buildings and new dwellings in particular, is that we have very ambitious uh, performance requirements for new dwellings. Uh, they're possibly the, the most uh, um, the most advanced performance uh, requirements um, in, in Europe. Uh, we're slightly ahead of the curve. Um, the rest of uh, Europe will be following in the next 12 months because we're all working uh, to the same directive. But the fact that we brought in uh, renewable energy requirements in 2007 uh, really gave us a head start and we've done a lot of uh, heavy lifting in terms of energy performance over the last 10 years. So I think a, a really important point is that our standards are very advanced and uh, very ambitious. Now, in terms of cost effectiveness, we have done a cost optimal calculation, which is required by the European Directive. It's net present value calculation, which allows us to compare um, actually hundreds of options applied to different types of buildings. And when we apply the different, different packages, including all types of renewables, photovoltaics, heat pumps, district heating, gas boilers, we find our, the, the results, not we find, the calculations show that the best energy performance for the lowest energy cost will be set at the energy performance requirements uh, that the Minister is proposing to introduce in the coming weeks. I think maybe it's worth saying, uh, Chair, I think the, uh, again the, the, the stats that you're referring to in the, the Climate Change Advisory Council report probably, I suppose, maybe re reflect a little bit uh, one of the points that I was making in, the, in my opening statement. that. We set the uh, performance standards and, as Sean has said, ambitious performance standards for, uh, for new buildings, residential and non-residential, and also significant requirements in relation to um, major renovations. And I think maybe the stats that you were referring to are a reflection of a broad housing stock much of which is uh, obviously of, of a particular age vintage. And while we set standards for what uh, needs to be achieved in terms of renovations, we don't, we don't require uh, those renovations to be carried out. So I suppose that uh, is probably territory that you, you, you've probably covered already with, with Decay when they were in here around how the, what incentives and supports are to be made available in order to encourage people uh, to come forward with renovations of the housing stock which when they do when they then actually do that they will have to comply with the performance standards that are that are set i think that's key for our committee in, in relation to the cross governmental approach to this and working together with joined up thinking across departments so that's a key area i know for us to to consider here as a committee. I'm going to bring in uh, Senator Tim Lombard. You have about 10 minutes. Well, thank you, Chair. I mightn't quite need full 10 minutes, but I'll. Um, first of all, I'd like to welcome John McCartney's team. Great to have you here. I think when you look at local government and your remit itself, you have a, a significant player in this actual debate itself, whether it is the actual policy that you um, do here or you're in charge of local government and so many remits that are so important for this issue itself. Can I go into a few details of your opening statement and you explained in detail how you believe that the actual planning of our cities and towns is going to be key 
and you mentioned brownfield sites and developing the brown, brownfield sites and 40 per cent that's required to go forward. And I think as a public representative that's a very, very important um, initiative that we need to be driving forward. Do you feel that you will get that support when it comes to the actual elected members of local authorities? take into consideration that most of that will be falling under the remit of county development plans, which in turn will fall under the remit of actually the local councillor itself. And how do you feel the resistance that is there in some cities and some towns to going high-rise will actually play out with your actual proposals itself? Because I would know from my own experience there would be an anxious nature regarding some members of some local authorities regarding going high-rise. I think that's an issue that needs to be addressed. I think it's a very obvious issue. And I think I'm just wondering, do you believe that legislation regarding how a local county development plan should be drafted or so forth, how would you go around that problem of ensuring that you can get the brownfield sites developed in our city and also going up if appropriate, if you believe that's appropriate? You also gave a presentation, or a partial presentation, was about um, solar farms and the guidelines, or the lack of guidelines regarding solar farms. Could I ask you to maybe to elaborate on that issue? It's an issue that I took interest in, uh, um, a considerable interest in my part of the world, about the amount of applications that's been granted for solar farms over the last few years, and the major lack of planning guidelines. And if you look at the lack of solar farm guidelines and whether it's your department or the department of, uh, of uh, Dennis Lockton's department, there seems to be a, a, a reluctance from both departments to get involved in those guidelines and actually drafting and putting forward guidelines. Taken into consideration, we have guidelines and renewed actual guidelines with the wind industry. We don't seem to have that guidelines at the moment, uh, whether it's for a community that might have an issue with a solar farm or whether it's for the actual proposed developer itself. I think that kind of um, security of tender is something that we need to look at, and there is a gap there at the moment. And maybe you might clarify do you believe solar farm guidelines are important? Do you believe that we should be looking at getting clarity in that market itself? And if so, do you think there's going to be a, a, a body of work done regarding that issue? Um, one of the amazing figures that I came across was that from now till 2040, I think we're proposing building is it half a million units, which is a very significant sum. Um, local authority element, as you've seen from the budget yesterday, will be a considerable part of that. I assume you're proposing exceptionally high energy standards with those actual um, units itself. But for the 136,000 local authority houses that are already built, how long do you think it will take the local authorities to actually retrofit the entire local authority stock to ensure that we could bring it up to standard? It's a considerable sum of 136,000 units. It's going to take a considerable body of work with a considerable body of finance. Where do you see that fitting into the actual proposal itself? And have you a timeline set out somewhere along the line regarding that issue itself? Another issue would be um, the actual electric car and electric car infrastructure, which you uh, mentioned towards the tail end of your speech. It is a significant issue. Uh, 2010, there was a major rollout of well, 1,000 units of electric car charging points. Where do you see that legislation actually coming in, in vogue regarding guidelines to ensure that we have electric car charging points as a part of the planning commission itself? Where do you see that happening? And in particular, with the vast sum of money attached to local government at the moment and local government developments, I'm not aware of any local government development, um, social housing or formal housing project that has an electric car charging point attached to it. And where do you think your guidelines with your planners and your engineers and your department are going to come into the plans that are coming before you? So in a nutshell, if there was a, a plan for a local authority housing estate in Cork tomorrow morning, what are the criteria that your department would be looking for? Would it be to install electric charging, charging points? And should the local government section and the local authorities be taking the initiative and the lead to ensure that we have these electric charging points per housing estate, which we should have. That kind of core infrastructure needs to be tied in. And I think if the local government don't do it, it's very hard for the developers to do it. So I'd be asking, when do you propose to move that kind of technology, that kind of infrastructure, into our own housing stock itself? And I think that's a very significant investment 
because what it would really mean is showing example, showing leadership, because we have seen significant developments, Part A plan permissions granted through Linton, Brettingham County and country. We haven't seen very much infrastructure regarding this issue. So you might clarify those issues if you could. Thank you, Senator. Senator. So I might do one. To yep. first, Mr. McCarthy. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator. And I'll just take these in, in turn and um, my call and some of my colleagues as we as we work our way uh, as we work our way through them. Um, starting out in relation to uh, in relation to the NPF, um, uh, the as you've rightly said, the, the the ambitions of the of the NPF are are significant in terms of. What it seeks to achieve around how we how we plan for the future future development, um, and it's very clear that it aims to deliver a pattern of development that is different from what we've had, um, and I suppose has that kind of disruptive um, element uh, element to it. Um, it is obviously a high level national strategy. And the, the two next uh, critically important pieces of the jigsaw are going to be the regional spatial and economic strategies, which are being worked on by the three regional assemblies at the moment and will likely go to public consultation in all three cases within the next, uh, within the next few weeks. And uh, when those are adopted, that they in turn, um, if you like, guide the adoption of um, uh, city and county development plans. So it's really to try and ensure that there's that cascade from the centre to the regional to the local and that it all it all makes uh, it all makes sense at the end of the day, as you as you rightly say, um, when it comes to the regional spatial economic strategies and then to city and county development plans, that they are for the elected members to uh, to adopt as part of the uh, as part of the de the democratic process. Um, and I'm sure I think there are already in the context of the RSESs there are already quite a few debates going on and. That, that's as it should be, because if, uh, if the NPF is designed to try to deliver a, a different form of planning and development into the future, it would be a bit worrying, I suppose, to some extent, if there weren't debates of that kind uh, going on. And I've no doubt they will continue on through the consultation process on the RSESs and down to city and county development plans. At the, um, in terms of high-rise versus uh, being, being a part of that, um, I think there's, there's high rise and there's, uh, there's high density, um, and certainly I think we've come uh, in many areas where we've, uh, we've planned and, and developed over the last while, we have come a long way in terms of higher density without necessarily sort of going very, very high rise, uh, and you can achieve a lot in that space by, by good and imaginative uh, design. Um, we, uh, we are out uh, at consultation, the consultation period is just finished, in relation to new guidelines on uh, heights in relation to apartment development. So there, those guidelines will be, I'd expect, will be finalised shortly. I won't say where, where they're going to land because we're, we're looking at the, at the um, responses that have come in on the public consultation process. But um, there, are cho there are choices and decisions that, that do have to be made if we if we want to deliver a, uh, a sort of a, an Ireland in 2040 in the in the planned way that the NPF talks about, it it does have to be different from from the way that we've done it, and that does present challenges around issues around density, around high rise, and the the use that we make of uh, of brownfield uh, brownfield sites. Um, ultimately, at the end of the at the end of the day, you uh, you would hope that. Um, the, uh, the process through the RACSs and the city and county development plans would actually get us to where we need to be. Um, I suppose I'm around long enough to, to know that difficult situations arise and um, there are times when ministerial powers of direction are, um, uh, have to be considered and in sometimes actually deployed. Um, we'll just have to see, I suppose, how, how things progress on, uh, on the work that's underway. Um, but I think I think there's a there's a, a level of ambition, and a, and a sort of a, a future way of planning that a, has a, a huge attraction to it. And I'd hope that city and county development plans would would recognise and reflect that in due course. But we'll uh, we'll have to see how that uh, we'll have to. I'm fundamentally believe in in, in, in democracy, Senator. And um, uh, look, as I say, I can see already in some of the debates that are going on, people are people have genuine concerns and issues. But I think that the debates that are going on are reflecting a, 
a sense of people wanting to try to get their heads around what do these things mean and look, we'll, we'll see how that, uh, how that pans out. In relation to solar farms, um, I suppose we are talking to, um, to Minister Nocton's department in, uh, in relation to that. Uh, issue and specifically around whether, um, as part of their renewable energy uh, rollout, whether the, uh, the need for planning guidelines is something that we, we need to, uh, to act on. We, we tend to um, roll out planning guidelines sparingly enough in, in, the, overall, uh, in the overall context, uh, certainly when you look at, uh, at other jurisdictions um, and the extent to which they, they sort of issue planning guidelines from the centre. We tend to do them on very specific issues in, uh, in specific, uh, in speci on kind of specific types of, uh, types of development. But as I said in the, in the opening statement, I mean, we have to go through that process with decay and if, if the outcome of that process is that yeah, there is a need for consistency and sort of guidance around how the, uh, those types of developments are actually dealt with uh, by individual planning authorities or on board Planola on appeal, then we'll certainly we'll engage, with that, uh, we'll engage with that need as we have on other areas and as we are trying to finalise on, uh, on the wind energy guidelines which are referred to at the, um, at the, at the start. Um, in terms of the uh, housing um, ambition, um, you're, you're absolutely right, so it is over half a million new homes is what uh, the National Planning Framework uh, considers will be required um, over the period of 2040, taking account of the, the population projections that, uh, that, are, uh, that are in place. In terms of uh, social housing, um, I um, outlined at the, at the start the, um, the ambitious um, performance-based uh, requirements that we, are, we have in place already through part L of the building regulations and which we will now be accelerating further once we finalise shortly the revisions to those regulations that are necessary in order to get us the final part of the journey towards, uh, towards INZEB. Um, needless to say, social housing developments absolutely will we'll have to comply with those in the same way as, uh, as any other housing developments uh, would need to. And I think there would be there would be a reasonable track record that would show that even ahead of time in the past, where local authorities have come forward with proposals uh, to be almost nearly demonstration projects to take us further along uh, further along journeys that we need to travel, we're certainly open uh, we're certainly open to, to 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 doing that. But I suppose we're we're getting to a point now where the actual performance requirements and the further step that we'll be uh, that we'll be putting in place through the new regulations is going to be, uh, as Sean said, uh, even more at the cutting edge in terms of, uh, in terms of, uh, of energy and emissions uh, performance. In terms of, uh, of charging points, I might ask one of my colleagues maybe just to outline there are requirements on that in the, uh, in the INZEB directive, which we will be uh, incorporating into regulations in due course, uh, and we'll go, to, we'll go to consultation on those, um, uh, on those next year. And again, any social housing developments will have to comply with those in the same way as, as other ones. But maybe, Sean, would you be able to say a few words on the, on the charging infrastructure and the charging points, uh, please? Under the Energy Performance of Buildings Directive, we were required to introduce um, infrastructure for EV charging. Um, the, the directive requires that for non-residential buildings with more than 10 parking spaces, uh, that will ensure the installation of at least one charging point and the installation of ducting infrastructure for at least one in five parking spaces. That's for new uh, non-residential buildings and buildings undergoing a uh, major renovation. Similarly, for new residential buildings and buildings undergoing major renovation with more than 10 parking spaces, the directive requires that we shall ensure the installation of ducting infrastructure for every parking space. So there is a requirement there in the directive that we will be introducing into regulations uh, next year to ensure the inst installation of uh, ducting infrastructure and in the case of non-residential buildings of at least one uh, recharging point for new buildings and buildings undergoing major renovation. So that's where building regulations re apply, apply. In addition to that, uh, for existing buildings, by March uh, 2020, we're required to put in place regulations that non-residential buildings with more than 20 parking spaces, um, existing non-residential buildings with more than 20 parking spaces, um, will have a minimum number of charging points uh, from 2025. So by March 2020, 
Uh, for new buildings and buildings undergoing major renovation, there will be a requirement for infrastructure and, in the case of non-residential buildings, a recharging point. And then for all existing buildings with more than all existing non-residential buildings with more than 20 parking spaces, we're required to put into legislation by March of 2020, 20, by March of 2020 that they will have a minimum number of recharging points. So they, they would be buildings that wouldn't necessarily be undergoing major renovation works. Sorry, I'm conscious I didn't deal with your last question, Senator, which was around the social housing stock and the, and, and the, uh, and the retrofitting uh, of, uh, of that. Um, we're, we're just about transitioning from, uh, from uh, a first phase of uh, a retrofitting programme um, uh, in the social housing stock, uh, which has seen over 60,000 of the social housing homes uh, having cavity wall and attic insulation. So that was a a very initial um, programme of work which we introduced in 2013, I think from, from memory, um, and it, I suppose it, it tried to use the level of resources that we had available and we expected to, to have available in order to tackle, um, I suppose, some of the, maybe some of the easier uh, wins uh, in the social housing stock. We are um, working at the moment on finalising arrangements towards uh, introducing a second phase um, and that will be a more uh, a more ambitious um, uh, program of action and in that area we'll obviously be looking to try to target in the first instance uh, the oldest social housing stock. Uh, uh, we estimate that there's about 40% of um, our social housing stock is built within the last 20 years, about 30% between 20 and 40 years, and the, the remaining 30% over uh, over 40 years. Um, so those ones would obviously those oldest ones would have a, an energy uh, building uh, um, energy rating of somewhere in the E to G category. So those will be our. I suppose our main focus for the purposes of uh, of phase two, how quickly we actually get to complete that oldest 30% of the social housing stock in terms of the phase two programme will obviously be dependent on the, um, uh, the, the costs per unit and the overall level of funding available. But clearly, if you're talking about 30% uh, of the stock being over 40 years old, that's about 40,000 units. So it is, it's a significant programme that will take a number of years uh, to, um, uh, to deliver. But that's where, we're, that's where we're going to start in phase two. Yeah, I'd be very brief. I know I'm going to be just get clarity on the electric car charge, if I could, from Sean. I think you've updated us here with uh, very, very important information. Regarding the directive, in particular, for the um, non residential car parking spaces, or could I say the existing car parking spaces, are you saying from, from 2020? Up to 2025, we need to be retrofitting these non these spaces where there, wall, where there is no car parking space. Will there be a kind of retrofit of estates, business centres, that kind of area, or is it only for new bills? Yeah, so the, the requirements of the directive are that non-residential buildings with more than 20 parking spaces, so it has to have more than 20 parking spaces, and they should be within the building or adjacent to the building. So, you know, we're talking about a specific type of building here. And the requirement into the directive is that we'll lay down the requirements uh, for the installation of a minimum number of recharging points, that, which will need to be determined. Uh, so we need to lay down that regulation by March 2020 to apply from uh, 2025. So there is a five-year, or, or well, yeah, five-year lead-in period to prepare for that regulation. The owner of the car parking spaces would pay for that. Would that be? Well, it will be uh, the, the owners of the builder of okay. buildings would be responsible. And when it comes to say private housing estates around Linter Britain's country, is there any proposal to look at them regarding retrofitting them for? Car park, uh, for electric car park and so currently we're looking at the provisions of the directive and implementing the directive. We will be consulting with uh, DK and seeing what their plans are as well. And there is a LEV uh, task force uh, looking at these issues. So we will be uh, consulting <coughs> on, these on the, these issues as and well. When do you think that consultation or consul Well, we've already started consultation with the National Standards Authority of Ireland, the Commissioner for Regulation of Utilities. We obviously have to prepare uh, the regulations and part of the development of the regulatory impact assessment over the, the coming months uh, will require us to, to um, discuss this with DK. And will you need some kind of one like ESB networks to be the figurehead or is it the department going to be the figurehead or you're just going to put the regulations in place and leave 
uh, industry sorted? I, I think the detail of how the regulation will be written isn't clear yet. Okay. That's something we have to work through. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Cham uh, Jack Chambers. Thanks, Chair, and uh, I'd like to thank the officials for, for coming before us. Just a few questions. I just want some clarity on the 2025, um, I suppose, direct figure around the uh, our target for the infrastructural uh, element of the electric vehicle installation. Is that the end date for implementation, or it's between 2020 and 2025? Can you just provide a timeline of when you expect that to be delivered? Because my fear would be that we could have, I suppose, an infrastructural deficit when I think the market will probably have, have geared up in advance of that. So it could be a case that we haven't, we could find ourselves in a scenario where the core pieces of housing infrastructure has, haven't caught up when the market, I think, will have advanced itself to a much greater extent by that period. And can you try and accelerate that timeline uh, beyond the directive, uh, what the directive has set out? So, for example, you mentioned 2020 to 2025 around the consultation process that's ongoing there. Is there a way of fast tracking that um, to try and ensure that the infrastructure is there? Because I, I think we're going to see a huge acceleration of this in, in, in probably by 2020. Uh, and what we don't want to see is you know, the places where people are living uh, not being retro, not being fitted for electric vehicles, and this is something we can predict right now. Um, so I'd hate to think in, you know, 10 years' time that the reason people aren't using electric vehicles or can't get one is because we haven't retrofitted the uh, the infrastructure soon enough. Um, so maybe you can maybe enlighten us more about the timeline, or is there any way of accelerating that? So I think we need to differentiate between new buildings and those going undergoing major renovation and okay. existing buildings which aren't undergoing any works. Mm. So new buildings and buildings which are undergoing uh, major renovation, we're required to have the regulations for infrastructure in by March 2020. So mm. that's that's uh, quite a short time frame. Um, we will, we're working with the National Standards Authority of Ireland. We obviously have to have a specification and a standard. Uh, that's going for public consultation uh, by the NSAI Standards Committee by the end of uh, the year. Mm. Um, that public consultation has to be reviewed. In parallel, we'll be developing our regulation um, to, to, to have it in place in, in, in the required timeline. Within, um, 15 months uh, okay. essentially and it will apply it will apply uh, from then on but the exact detail and what the transition arrangements are we'll have to develop as mm. part of the development of the regulation and part of the public consultation uh, period but for new buildings and buildings undergoing major renovation there will be a, a regulation in place for buildings with more than 10 parking spaces uh, by march 2020. for existing buildings the reason there's a five-year lead-in is as as you have highlighted is that uh, there needs to be some uh, uh, build-up time to allow uh, buildings to to retrofit all, uh, these uh, charging points and um, that's why there's a time span uh, given for the introduction of, of those uh, what, what will be the consequence as per the directive if they don't do that so th the requirement will be um, to put into regulation uh, that uh, well definitely for new buildings and buildings undergo a major re renovation for the majority that, that'll, fall, that'll fall under building regulations so it'll, it'll be subject to the building control um, uh, process. Uh, for existing buildings uh, that have more than 20 parking spaces, um, that's an unusual regulation. It's one we haven't introduced uh, before, where we retrospectively go to buildings and put in a requirement when there's no work, uh, no works taking place. It's not something that would uh, fit within building regulations. It wouldn't fit in under the Building Control Act. So the mechanism for introducing that and enforcing it isn't clear. Uh, the commissioning is, is developing guidelines at the moment um, as to how we should introduce uh, the re regulation. So we, I, we have to develop um, the application of that regulation a bit further. And what do you expect the enforcement procedure to be? Because obviously we're, when we're talking about existing buildings, we're talking about the vast majority of car spaces. So what do you expect the enforcement mechanism to be in terms of the retrospective element of it? And does the regulation 
like obviously we've issues with retrospective laws as, as they are. How do, how do you see that working? Yeah, so that has to be developed. Um, the regulation, the, the directive was published in uh, July of this year. Uh, we're looking at the regulation. We're meeting with the Commission and uh, developing the guidelines. Um, as I said, it's an unusual regulation, not just for Ireland, for, for, for other member states as well. So how it will be applied is something that needs to be determined. To okay. determined. Just in terms of the social housing stock, um, obviously you mentioned the 64,000 uh, has, has been completed to date. Um, what targets are there to ramp up the programme? When do you expect, what's your timeline to get to an end point where we have all the social housing stock retrofitted and uh, maybe you can, you can enlighten us on that. And also, has there been an audit done of the category of social housing that falls into the, the worst energy rated uh, houses and, and when will they, are they being specifically targeted? Yeah, uh, thanks, uh, thanks Deputy. Um, the, we've, uh, we've just, we're just about sort of this year on into next year we'll be, we'll be completing phase one of the, the, the retrofitting, uh, the retrofitting programme um, and we'll, we'll migrate across then into, into phase two. We've, we've been through some pilot work on phase two uh, but we just need to do some further work on it before we, uh, before we roll it out. Um, I suppose in terms of, uh, of audit, we're working on the basis that we, um, as we roll out phase two, that we will need to target those that are oldest um, uh, on, the, on the clear assumption that they are, uh, they are our uh, poorest energy uh, energy performers. So as I was saying to, to, to Senator Lumbert earlier on, there's about, uh, we estimate about 30% of the social housing stock as it stands at the moment is over 40 years old. So they that would equate to about 40,000-ish uh, units. So they will be our, our priority in terms of, uh, in terms of not, not exclusively because there will be there will be mixed areas where there'll be some newer stuff as well and from an economic point of view, it may make sense to, 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 to be a little bit flexible in relation to it. But they will be our priority for um, for phase two, um, and I suppose the, the timeline for actually completing a phase two retrofitting on those will be uh, will be determined by the, the programme of funding that we have available over the, the following however many years. But on the basis that it it is it has taken us from thirteen to eighteen, what's that six years to kind of do phase one, which is a, a much lighter sort of programme of work for sixty odd uh, sixty odd thousand. You are talking about a programme of uh, of a number of years if we're going to actually be able to to get phase two done uh, on those priority ones. How many years? How many years? Like when it will it will be dependent on the on the funding that's available. Okay. And just last question, Chair. Um, Obviously, your department has come in for a lot of criticism about uh, approval processes and you know timelines around, say, housing approval. I suppose two elements to this question. Number one, what's the climate change element of your process of approval for housing submissions that are made by different local authorities? Um, and perhaps you can enlighten us on that. And then the second part of the question is, can you provide a clarity to this committee and maybe to public representatives about how your department makes decisions around housing uh, projects that are submitted to you because um, you know it's something that is going back from local authorities that it can take two years for your department to approve various housing projects and I'd just like to get clarity on that and then like to get clarity on what the climate change decision making process is within that um, within that decision making. Thank you. Okay, I'll take the, uh, the the climate piece. Uh, the, the climate piece first. I suppose ultimately, we expect social housing. Uh, we expect social housing developments to be uh, to be compliant with the ambitious requirements, performance requirements that are there in the building in the building regulation. So that's th there really is no there's no issue really of uh, of any significance from that point of view. And in fact, as I mentioned earlier on, we've actually used social housing projects as demonstration projects. So, for example, we already have some social housing projects that are actually delivered to INZEB standard, even though we're only making finalising the set of regulations uh, now that actually will uh, introduce that as a, as a mandatory requirement. Uh, in relation to um, approval processes, um, you said to me, Deputy, that some people say that it takes the department two years to... I, I, I think no, no, I, being said. I think it's a good no, opportunity I, for you to clarify. Absolutely. Yeah. I, and I'm, I'm glad, in some respects, I'm glad you, I'm glad you raised it, uh, yeah. Deputy. Um, there's... 
local is just it's in nobody's interest that local authorities are saying something takes two or three or four years and it's not it's in nobody's interest that we're saying oh no it doesn't take two three or four years so uh, in order to deal with this we recognize when we um, put rebuilding ireland in place that we were moving from a situation where local authority house building had virtually ground to a halt um, and we needed to move and we needed to ensure that we could move from that situation to delivering the ambitious build programme that Rebuilding Ireland provides for. So in order to um, I suppose position ourselves to do that, we sat down with the local authority sector and we have now agreed a programme that takes us all of the way from the first thought of a social housing project all the way through to getting on site. We have mapped that versus best practice in private development. It's a period of 59 weeks from very first thought to actually getting on site. Um, I've heard some people, uh, when we've spoken about that, talk about saying it takes 59 weeks for the department to approve a project. When I talk about 59 weeks, it's 59 weeks to design it, to take it through the Part 8 process, to take it through procurement and to actually get on site. Within that 59 weeks, we have four stages, and for each of those stages, we have made commitments as to how long projects will be with us. So if you look at the 59 weeks in total, a project is with us for 15 of those weeks. The balance of the 44 weeks is the, the design work by the local authorities, the Part 8 process, which has a number of weeks of public consultation, and the actual procurement, which does take, uh, which does take time. So I think from all of our points of view, certainly and I think the, the local authorities share this uh, perspective at this stage, our key requirement now is that we have that timeline in place, that we actually adhere to it and we push projects. And you can see that in the Social Housing Construction Status Report, excuse me, uh, which we publish on a quarterly basis. Um, and we've published, I think, six, I think, from memory of those at this stage. The first one was the end... 20, 20, in 2016, and we've published them then quarterly from, from then onwards. So you can see as each quarter goes by, the number of projects and the number of houses obviously in the programme um, in, is increasing and has increased very, very substantially. So our, our key aim now is to ensure that both we honour uh, our commitments as part of that process and local authorities do likewise and we get houses built for people. So you, you don't think it's, you're, you're not, this is what I'd like to, you're, you're not exceeding your 15 week window we, at, at, any, at any level? We've, that regime has, is not long introduced. We, uh, we have to measure it and measure it for all of the stages and we have a, a delivery office which is now um, uh, being resourced to actually measure that so we can measure compliance versus the, 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 the 59 weeks for all of the stages that we have within that and make sure that it is actually working the way that, uh, the and, way that it, it, and, it, and you're saying it is working from because I mean that the, the 15 week window is the, you know the blame has been pinned at the department but are you saying that from uh, you're, are you telling this committee that uh, you're adhering to the 15 week window or are you exceeding it or have you exceeded there would be cases where it would have been exceeded and that would have been I'm pretty sure on the basis of I mean, any process works that if we say that we will do an approval at a particular point in the process that it's only going to take three weeks that assumes that we get everything that we need in order to be able to make a decision okay. so I mean these things can be argued around the place but in uh, from where the department sits and I can say this for, for all of my colleagues here and others that work in this our business is to get houses built for people and we want to work and that's why we put the 59 week process in place in partnership with the local authorities right. and it's really now up to all of us us for sure and the local authorities to honour that process and make it work and deliver for the people that we need to deliver for thank you very much i'm just conscious of the number of speakers ahead so uh, deputy marcella corkin kennedy thank you very much and thank you uh, mr mccarthy and your officials for coming in this afternoon I, I just wanted to ask you a question around um whether you are satisfied that there is sufficient interdepartmental connection because you know it's been coming across to us from other um uh, people who have come in to help us with our work on this, that there really should be a whole of government and a whole of society approach. And if we were to do that, with, you know, to be really meaningful about this, then there would need to be maybe greater engagement across departments and maybe that the Taoiseach's department would be who it, the, the, that particular committee, say, would be accountable to. So I just wanted to wonder what your, what your views are on that. And also, Met Erin is under your uh, remit, and um, there's a, a, a very strong uh, view, I think, that... Uh, 
uh, Met Ireland could play a better role in communicating the need for, um, uh, I suppose, explaining climate, what's happening with the climate, um, and that it's a missed opportunity really to, to, to reach uh, the citizen and what um, are the barriers to Met Ireland doing that, if, if there are indeed any. Uh, the other question I have is in relation to whether or not you have responsibility for food waste. Is that gone for me now, or is it still a G? No, that's Minister Nocton's department. It's gone for me yeah. now. Yeah. Okay. Uh, just in relation to um, uh, regulations and you know the fact that we've witnessed considerable drought this year, um, if you have any um, requirements in terms of uh, water harvesting in uh, new builds, both buildings or um, single dwellings, or indeed commercial dwellings, um, I th because I think that's probably something that's going to be required in the long term, uh, or indeed the short term, as we can uh, see. There's a new word there that I came across in your document, which I never heard before, barrage. What does that mean? And if you can explain whether it's been successful in other countries, what, this, you know, what, what that exactly means. Um, just around the mitigation and forestry, you're talking about developing additional um, uh, forests, you know, mixed species and all of that. And if, you know, if your role in that uh, goes so far as to engaging with the um, um, state agencies that hold large land banks. Um, the other thing then is the national planning framework and around the local authorities' role in that. I mean, if you look at the IPCC report that was, produced, was published in recent days, you know, is there, are you accelerating now um, the work that uh, you had planned to do under the national planning framework? Because um, it strikes me that um, you know, all of the departments, I think, would need to be putting the, 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 the foot on the accelerator as far as that goes. Um, although not, not fossil fuels or electric acceleration would be acceptable, all right. Um, the other one then is around the governments of the, uh, the, 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 the national planning framework. You know, obviously, again, you're looking at interdepartmental, you know, what governance structure is in place around, around uh, achieving uh, what's required. That do for start. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Um, okay. In terms of uh, interdepartmental uh, interdepartmental connection, um, I suppose uh, you would have had some discussion, I think, on this with uh, with um, colleagues from Minister Nocton's department when when they were here, um, as I suppose they they lead in terms of the the uh, the climate agenda and the, the mitigation action plan and indeed on uh, on climate adaptation i suppose from from our perspective um i don't have any sense that um uh, that a lack of interdepartmental uh, engagement is uh, is a barrier. I mean, colleagues here in different interdepartment. There are a whole range of interdepartmental structures for um, uh, for uh, how we work together, including in the climate space. And, and some of the colleagues here are on some of those uh, inter uh, interdepartmental uh, interdepartmental structures. And I mean, in some of the the, the conversation that we've had already uh, today, obviously on things like uh, on uh, renewable energy. We obviously have huge engagements with Minister Nocton's department around their plans on offshore and what does that mean for us in terms of the regulatory uh, uh, regime we need to put in place. We talked to Senator Lombard in relation to uh, solar and what we might need to do from a planning point of view for um, uh, the rollout of solar uh, again, which is Minister Minister Nocton's uh, Minister Nocton's department. So I think there's um, certainly we are active in a lot of interdepartmental uh, engagement. Um, and I suppose it's it's probably it's probably more the the, 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 the naughtiness of some of the issues rather than uh, rather than lack of engagement that uh, is sometimes the, uh, the the nut that needs to be uh, the, nut, the nut that needs to be cracked and maybe I might just move on to the NPF and I'll come back to the other issues because it is it, it's a, it's a sort of a similar uh, a similar issue. Um, the uh, the NPF and the uh, National Development Plan together um, are sort of fall under the Project Ireland 2040 uh, umbrella, um, and uh, as part of the implementation process, the uh, the government agreed to put in place a delivery board, um, which is uh, co-chaired between myself and the Secretary General of the Public Department of Public Expenditure and Reform because they lead on the NDP. Um, and it's comprised basically of uh, all of the uh, secretaries general from departments that have um, a role in implementing the, the NPF and in delivering on the NDP. 
Uh, that structure is, has been put in place now, is up and running. It has met on, uh, on four, uh, four occasions, uh, reports back to, uh, to government and the relevant cabinet committee, and um, the intention is that it, uh, it will produce an annual report to show on, a, on an annual basis the work that it's undertaking in terms of uh, delivering on the NPF and the NDP. So, for example, one of the things that we have been looking at in that uh, forum in the early meetings that it has had is the issues around the regional spatial economic strategies that I spoke to Senator Lombard about uh, earlier on, because they are the crucial next step in taking what the NPF um, aims to achieve and cascading it down to the regional before it moves on to the uh, before it moves on to the local. So we would have had representatives from the three regional assemblies in to talk to us in relation to the work that they are doing as part of that cascading uh, cascading exercise. Again, all as part of the process of trying to ensure that the various pieces of the jigsaw are all there and that they're all uh, slotting in together as uh, as they need to be. Um, Chair, do you mind if I just have a that, because we had asked earlier whether we would get the copy of the first report from that forum to government. I believe you've made a single report so far, and just to aid our work, we were asked, we asked would it be possible to get a copy of that. The Secretary General from Decay didn't seem to be able to say whether he could or couldn't. Could you provide us with a copy of that report? I don't think it was a, it was a report, it was a memorandum that went to, that went to government, um, uh, Deputy. Um, Certainly, the intention is that we would do an annual report, which would be published. But I think, that if I'm if I'm interpreting you right, I think what what what, uh, what was under discussion previously was, and it was it was it was more a uh, an update on the implementation of the NDP, uh, and it came from the Minister for Public Expenditure and Reform. But it was a memorandum that went to government as opposed to a report. Could we but have that? Um, I'm not sure what the uh, I'm not the owner of that memorandum now. I didn't put it to government, but I can certainly follow up with the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform in relation to it. Sorry, thank you. Um, then, uh, sorry, just to follow up. Sorry, yes, uh, met uh, met Aaron. Um, uh, met Aaron is uh, is very active in the uh, in the climate uh, uh, in the climate area in uh, in a number of uh, in a number of respects, particularly in relation to research. And uh, particularly in relation to, um, uh, I suppose, taking climate uh, and meteorological observations over many years, and looking at them, analysing them, and trying to draw, um, draw, uh, draw out sort of scientific um, scientific evidence to show how uh, how um, uh, weather pa weather patterns uh, have uh, changed and continue to uh, continue to change. I think there has been some discussion at, uh, at times in relation to whether, as part of sort of routine weather forecasts on, on television, whether uh, there's scope for some element of kind of climate communication to be uh, to be built into that. Um, I'd. I'm not sure that that's the right uh, the right space. I'm not I'm not saying at all that that's not something that doesn't need to be done. I suppose. I think the climate agenda, um, the, the whole issue of communication and individual behaviour and behavioural patterns and how you influence be, uh, behavioural change is something absolutely that, that needs to form part of the, uh, the climate agenda. And I think certainly the role that Met Aaron could play as part of that, absolutely open, open to that. I suppose the reason that I, I say about the, the weather forecast is that it's a what, two, two and a half minute broadcast. Um, I think the audience that it attracts is very much an audience that is uh, is, th is wanting to know kind of what's happening in the next couple of days, and uh, I think we would need we would need some people with certainly with more communications um, skills than than I do, just to be able to, to make sure that if if that if if the Met Aaron were going to take on a role of that kind, that it would actually deliver what what we wanted to deliver. Maybe an alternative is that. There might be a once a month uh, or, uh, or, or other frequency uh, type of engagement where it would be specifically on climate issues, so you would actually tee it up as that. I mean, for example, we we do at the moment, uh, our colleagues in MET do the, the, the weekly farming forecast on a Sunday, and farmers, it's something that grabs the attention of farmers. They engage with it because it gives the, the perspective for the for the week ahead. So I think we'd need to tease out those sorts of uh, those sorts of issues. But absolutely, Met are very very active in the uh, in the climate space and um, will continue to be as part of the process of building the evidence base and trying to understand 
changing weather patterns, how they're manifesting themselves, and to be able to, and they're certainly doing a lot of, uh, of work in, in an area that's still very much uh, in its early stages of development around climate attribution and trying to understand, well, to what extent can different um, uh, and changing weather patterns be attributable to particular uh, climate, uh, climate phenomenon? But they're, they're active in the space and will continue to be. I think that was that everything. Uh, sorry, did I miss Water harvesting? Water harvesting. I think that is. We do have guidance on that, um, Sarah. I think it's not mandatory, yeah. but I think we have guidance. Yes, exactly. In Part H of the building regulations, there's guidance on uh, on uh, rainwater harvesting. But do you think that there should be an urgency now on people actually having it as a mandatory requirement rather than a guidance? So the, the standards are there in terms of if you are doing it to to, to ensure that it's done properly. Yeah, but I mean it's not part of the requirement for uh, planning. Um, it's, grant it's not, of permission. I, I think the, the. I suppose we are uh, we are looking more generally at the at the water sector from a climate adaptation uh, from a climate climate adaptation point of view, um, and uh, that's a process. We we have to have a climate adaptation uh, strategy for the the water sector uh, in place by September of next uh, of next year. I don't know, Martin. Do you want to maybe just say a few words in in relation to what that's uh, what that's going to look at? The, um, the government published the, uh, the National Adaptation Framework uh, in, in January this year and a uh, government decision at the end of March set out that, we had to, that there were 12 areas where different uh, departments and public bodies had to produce uh, adaptation frameworks. Um, so we have responsibility for water quality and then water services infrastructure. Um, we're working to the timeline of the end of September. The, uh, the, in essence, what, you, what we're doing is looking at weather events uh, in, the, in the last 20 years, uh, then through modelling, looking at kind of how these are likely to change in the, in the, in the 20, 30 years ahead, uh, and then based on that, setting a prioritisation of what we think are the most serious issues and using those to, uh, to uh, set priorities for Irish water and the rural water sector, and that would encompass how, they, how their investment programme works, how they improve resilience, uh, and I suppose where they pull assets, how they climate proof them. Irish Water have been building these into their uh, into their uh, their business processes, and uh, we would we would envisage probably a, a six week public consultation as part of this uh, as well, uh, based on a on a draft plan, probably for next summer. Thank you. Barrage. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I, uh, I'm not sure actually I pronounced that word correctly. I'm not sure. Is, that, is it barrage? Basically, it's a type of, as they have in London, the, the Thames uh, barrage, which they deploy um, when, there's a, when, there's a risk of, uh, when there's a risk of flooding. Um, it's, I mean, it, it can come in many different forms. I mean, there's, there's, uh, it's the OPW that, uh, that lead on this sort of infrastructure. But, for example, they have a, a project which is um, uh, getting a lot of coverage at the moment in, in Cork in relation to how they protect the, the centre of the city from, uh, from flooding of the kind that it's had in the, in, the, uh, in the past. So it can go all the way from, as I say, a piece of infrastructure that is as, as significant as the, as the Thames barrier down to the very micro, which is something that you slot into the into the door frame or the uh, of your of your building or your house, if you're prone to uh, if you're prone to uh, to flooding, it's just it was really just to make the point that um, uh, as one of the issues, obviously, that needs to be addressed in the uh, in the climate context is the whole issue of flooding, flood prevention, flood management, um, and that's just one of the one of the, the potential uh, pieces of infrastructure that can can be deployed as part of the response to that. Mm. And just in relation to the um, question of Met Air, and you were talking about the potential and all of that, like, is there anything specific actually happening around that and figuring out how it can be used? Um, or is there a question of whether they're contracted to RT to do a specific item which is forecast and that there's no scope to do anything further? Is, is, is that the no, situation? I think or? They're, they're, they're contracted to RT uh, to, to do the, the forecasting um, and that's uh, arising, out of a, arising out of a procurement process. But I, I w that's not really the... That, that wouldn't be a, a barrier. To the type of role that you uh, that you envisage. So, for example, they do they do the forecasting that they are required to do under their contract. But when we have severe weather events, you you see them on the on the television, sort of morning, noon, and night in different Sorry. in different contexts. So that wouldn't that wouldn't be the barrier. It's really more to try to, I suppose, be sure that what what role we we, we may ultimately assign to to Metair, that it is it is a role that 
there's clarity around what what is it we wanted to expect, who do we who do we think it should reach, and does it sit within the broader programme of communications that has to be put in place in relation to communicating climate and all of the issues that go with it. Mm. But is it something that you will be looking at specifically? There, are, there are already conversations going okay. on between our Met colleagues and RTE around right. some of these that are at a very early scoping mm. sort of mm. stage, mm. Uh, but the, those conversations are already yeah. going. Yeah. And just the question I asked there around the IPCC, whether that report, you know, sort of stimulates kind of urgent within yourselves to try and fast track work that you're doing? Well, I suppose it, um, to, uh, we, I say we um, kind of uh, sort of departmentally a bit schizophrenic now because we were, we were the Department of the Environment up until, up until two years ago, so we, we don't lead on, on climate anymore, but I suppose by virtue of having been in that space, mm -hmm. um, we would have had a lot of engagement with the climate agenda over many, many, uh, many, many years. So. I suppose the, the report in, uh, that you referred to that, uh, that was published in the, last, uh, in the last couple of days, in some respects, is, is just another reflection of the urgency of mm. the, the, the climate situation, which we would, uh, we would certainly have been alive to uh, for some considerable period of time, and I suppose is reflected in the fact that we actually made moves uh, on the building regulations front over a decade ago. Um, long before we were required to do so, that have really brought us to a point much, much earlier on in the process of nearly being at INZEB um, uh, requirements much earlier than we might otherwise have been. So that the remaining journey that we have to travel for, for INZEB purposes is, as a result, is now much less than what it would otherwise have been. Right, thank you. Thank you. I'm going to bring in Deputy Stanley next. Uh, thanks, Colonel. Look, um, I suppose, first of all, just welcome the. Uh, the uh, group from the department. <coughs> I think it's an important opportunity for us to try and deal with some of these, these issues. Just in relation to the electric vehicles, from what I understand, if I heard correctly, is that the, with all new developments over a certain size, over 10 dwellings, from 2020, there will have to be um, uh, charging points in place. Is that the, the 1st of January 2020 or the 30th of December, 21st of December 2020? Um, and just a related question to that, the issue of government buildings and the issue of, we we'll say, you know, buildings belong to the department, it could be the Department of Agriculture, it could be hospitals, it could be the local council offices, are there plans um, or is there a rollout happening at the moment to try and retrofit uh, charging points into those? Um, I suppose the easiest thing, if we go through the few questions I have first, maybe, um, and just, just in relation to it, again, it's a it's your department, the uh, planning issue as well. In relation to solar and wind, the, um, in the document that you have, you said that it's expected public consultation under revised draft guidelines together with a comprehensive uh, SEA uh, report, environmental report under the SEA process will be commenced in the coming weeks with the aim of issuing the finalised guidelines following detailed analysis and consideration of submissions and views received during the consultation process in 2019. <sighs> This has gone on years. It's gone on years. You were in that department. I was a spokesperson on that brief with Phil Hogan when he was here, you know, and um, Pat Rabbit. And, you know, there's a good few after coming and going since then. But just, you might give us, is there nothing can be done? Because literally what's happened there, and I've told the Minister this, is that the door will be closed, but the horse has bolted. The wind farms are up. They're up. The ones that shouldn't be up. We need wind farms, but there are some bad examples of wind farms, particularly in the mid in the Midlands, and the way it has been carried out, without any proper guidelines, never mind regulations being in place. But I just I want to just use the opportunity that you know outside of this building and outside of this city, it's happened. The show is over, and the ESP. I met the ESP last last Friday in relation to a number of things. And I discussed this with him, and they have said to me that in relation to, in relation to the um, uh, rollout of wind farms and the developments of it, that the grid is fairly well, fairly much up to capacity in some areas. You know, there's parts of the country where there won't be any more wind farms. So the show is over. You know, before we, without having the wind, without having the um, the, um, the the necessary guidelines in place. You know, and I could see this happening and. You know, I'm on the record of saying this month after month to minister after minister about this, and I'm using the opportunity here today to say to you, the officials, will someone, for God's sake, you know, uh, try and get those in place? Um, 
Just in, in relation to, to, to wind as well, just the, the onshore, onshore element of it is this. You know, okay, you know, it's a lot more costly up to now, but the new technology, and some countries are using floating wind farms. And, I mean, in, in Britain, in England, Scotland, and Wales, that is, um, there's 8.5% uh, of total generation is coming now uh, from, from offshore wind. And in terms of our research, where are we at in, in terms of moving uh, into that space? Um, because, obviously, you know, we do have an advantage being an island nation. Some people in the engineering profession claim that we could actually, you know, export and sell some of that wind, that offshore wind, to France, for example, who are soon going to be plugged into. We're soon going to have the, the Celtic interconnector. Um, we just move on to the area of housing. You said about the 59-week process and the four stages, but within those four stages, there's, uh, there are 19, 19 stages. And they're on the list circulated by your department, the local authorities. I don't have the copy of it with me, but I do have it in my briefcase upstairs uh, in the number of steps that's there. The problem is with it is that uh, if you take, for example, um, if you take, for example, the scheme planned in Port Arlington, Ballymorris, the 22 houses of Ballymorris, from the time of thought or conception to actually getting them built, from four years, three and a half to four years, and people, you know, local councillors, you know, are frustrated with this. Local officials are, are frustrated with it, and you can imagine what it's like for the people on the housing waiting list. Um, and can I just make a run something by you? Something that puzzles me: um, the county that that um, the deputy here beside me lives in, Deputy Prinka lives in. If I drive up there, on the way up there, I can see houses that were built similar to built the houses built in the county that I live in, that were built in the 30s, in the 40s, and in the 50s, and in the 60s. And you can see very similar designs, right? And one of the things that's done down the process, because I've talked to officials and engineers in the local authorities about this, because it's one of the things that would, would drive you, to, uh, would turn your hair grey quicker than it's already going. The, 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 uh, this, this, the, the whole cumbersome process, and the fact that every house has to be designed from scratch. And the point, the, the reason I raise this issue about, you know, and it's not the 1930s, I understand that, but had, there had no technology then. We have technology now. Right? And for example, some of the officials will be familiar with this, I'm sure. Cunnabury Way in Port Leash, they're almost uh, zero energy houses. You know, they the fit into that category that you mentioned, that nearly zero energy. You know, absolutely, I've been in them, top of the range. Happy, you'd heat them with a candle, even in the freezing weather last year, uh, the standard that they're built to. Huge, full credit to everybody. But why can't we, right? I want to make this simple. Use that design, and the design, and what I'm told as well from the engineers in county councils, is that what's causing one of the problems is the design around energy and everything like that. Now, can we not take that template, and we can use that in Donegal and in Offaly and in Waterford and in Dublin and wherever else, and in Mayo, where, where uh, the senator here to me left is from? Why can't we do that? So we have, and every house doesn't, you know, we can have three or four basic designs. And I can tell you that the people who want affordable housing and the people who want social housing, they'll be okay if there's seven or eight hundred people in another county living in a fairly similar looking house. It won't, it won't keep them awake at night. And it certainly won't keep me awake at night as a TD. And it shouldn't keep anybody here awake at night. You know, if we're getting people housed, you know, instead of tripping over people walking around outside this building here where people are sleeping on the street. And, in the, and unfortunately, it's happening in the, in, the, uh, in the provincial towns now as well. But the point I'm making there is, is why can't we have, you know, half a dozen generic designs or four generic designs, designs for different types of, you know, one bedroom, two bedroom, three bedroom and four bedroom houses and get on with it instead of having to go back to scratch. And the, the auctioneers, or the, the, sorry, the, the, the um, architects, the architects are the ones doing it. They're the ones who are rubbing their hands with this, you know, because they are now, they have skin in this game. And you can't blame them. It's their job to design. That's what they're there for. That's their profession. I'm not knocking them for that. But the point is, is there's no need to start from scratch and do it all over again. And I remember, and just make this point, last point to you, I remember when you brought in, when it was brought in that houses had to be architecturally designed. 
And someday, if you're in County Leash, I'll bring you and show you the ones that the council designed themselves. And I can tell you one thing, that were built in the 70s and the 80s, and in the 90s, right up to about, about what my recollection of it is when I was a county councillor, at about, at about 2001 or two. One, two, and three—a change that had to be architecturally designed, and I can take you into, I can take you to both types of houses, and the ones that are architecturally designed have huge, huge maintenance problems from the word go. The ones that were designed, not by, even by an engineer, the technician in Leash County Council used to design them on a desk. There's very little maintenance problems with them, and recurring maintenance problems because. It, they were very practically designed, but I want you to address that question. question. And the last one I want to tell you, uh, sorry, I addressed the wind farm guidelines, and just around the wind farms, uh, offshore and onshore. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Deputy. Um, I'm kind of, uh, I'll continue on into the into the four stage approval process again, seeing as it's uh, seeing as it's been raised. Not not something that uh, I, I'm not asking you no, to no, repeat no, an no, answer that you've already no, no, given. No, that's because fine. We have, no, no, it's an issue I, I accept. Action a little bit, and you don't need yeah. to repeat. No, but I accept that the deputy, the deputy has raised the has raised the issue. Yeah. And yeah. Was causing a problem. Absolutely, no problem with the energy yeah, but maybe just to take the uh, to take the issue in turn, I can't talk to you, Deputy, around offshore renewable policy because it's not it's not our area. That's Minister Nocton's uh, uh, department. But in terms of the the onshore stuff, um, absolutely, we would we would love to have had the uh, the wind guidelines in place. There have been a lot of policy issues that have had to be uh, had to be worked through over many different uh, many different um, governmental formations. Um, Unfortunately, what delayed us at the end was the impact of a European Court of Justice judgment, which means that we had to go through an SEA process. So that's the piece that has delayed us at the end. But that SEA and the environmental report, um, we're now at a point that in the next few weeks we'll actually be able to put them out to consultation. We generally allow eight weeks. Eight weeks is generally what we allow for consultation, so that will that will pretty much take us to Christmas, and that's why I mentioned early 2019 to finalise them. We need a few weeks at the end of the consultation period. Well, we may need. I mean, the, the last time when we did a, the previous round of public consultation on the first revisions to the the guidelines, we got from memory, I think, seven and a half thousand uh, submissions. So, um, uh, but we'll conclude it as quickly as we can after the consultation process is finished. But we have to, we, ha we do have to work our way through whatever we get as uh, as part of it. I would say, though, I mean, it hasn't been a blank canvas without those guidelines. The 2006 guidelines are there; okay. they still they still remain in force. And I don't, uh, I'm not disagreeing with you, Deputy, in terms of. Your, your, your views around certain projects that, that have, uh, have gotten uh, planning permission are in place, uh, but I suppose I'm equally aware of a lot of wind projects that have been refused planning permission, uh, either at local authority level or through, uh, or through on board, uh, on board Planola. But as I say, we're, uh, we're at the final stage. Once we get through this public consultation now on the, uh, the revisions, uh, we will get them finalised as quickly as we can, and, um, uh, but we will have to take account of the submissions that, that come in to us, because that's a, that's a critical part of the SEA process. Um, in terms of yeah, the floating firms, you talked about that. Um, okay, the, the, the four stage, I'm going to to come in in a minute on standard layouts, because we are, uh, we are, in, that, uh, we are in that space. Of, uh, of developing standard uh, standard layouts, but again, and in a to, to, to conscious of the chair's um, um, request not to, to use the committee's valuable time, but um, if a project is taking three and a half or four years of, of the kind that you've uh, you've referred to, um, it's not only local authority people, it's not only you, deputy, that are frustrated with that. We're frustrated with that as well, um, and. I've had cases that have been put to me in the past. I don't know whether this is one of them or not, but if so, it may well be if, it, if you're talking about three and a half or four years. There have been projects that have been around for that length of time, and the reason that they didn't progress previously was because in 2013-14 the funding just wasn't available for them. But uh, if there's a particular project, I wouldn't mind actually getting the detail of it because it is, uh, it is something that frustrates, uh, frustrates me quite, uh, quite a bit as, uh, as well. Um, I, I mean... We've actually introduced a, a one-stage process for, pro for the smaller projects, up to two million. There's about 200 of those projects that could proceed through a one-stage process. And I think from memory, I think it's about 12 have actually been projects where local authorities have actually availed of that process. So we want to put streamlined arrangements in place. We want to make sure that they work. 
Um, but as I say, if you have a specific uh, case that you, you, you referred to there for the three and a half or four years one, um, we might just have a, a word afterwards in terms of the, the, the detail of it. In terms of um, standard specs, uh, Sarah, would you say a few words on that, please? Uh, yes, yeah, so there's two projects that we're, we're um, working on at the moment. One is standard internal layouts. So uh, as you mentioned, you know that you don't have to start from scratch on every project. So those standard internal layouts would be for uh, two, three, four bedroom houses and uh, apartments also. Uh, and duplex uh, type units. Um, that work has been drawn up at the moment and uh, it should be uh, 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 um, published early next year. Uh, in addition to that, we're looking at standard specifications. So while the, the layouts are one element, it's the specification of all the materials and the, uh, the works that are involved in that. And we're looking at standardising them with, uh, or having a standard specification that local authorities can use. And we're working with a number of local authorities in uh, coming up with that at the moment. Um, all social housing uh, must comply with the building regulations. We do have some very good examples of where they've uh, piloted NZEB uh, standards uh, already, as, uh, as you mentioned yourself. And also, I suppose, the sustainable communities is another area where uh, social housing projects uh, embrace the, the climate action pieces like compact growth and making sure that the location of social housing uh, projects is within walking distance of amenities and stuff like that. And that's the type of uh, uh, decisions that we're trying to influence. You mentioned about a number of sub-stages within the four stage. I, I think that might be the guidelines that we produced last year with local authorities and that was in the interest of clarity and in improving the quality of submissions. So it's a kind of a uh, it's to simplify the process in terms of a tick box exercise. Do you have all these pieces of information so that the, um, the approval process can happen quickly within the, the three or four weeks that are allowed? But on that, could I just say to you that the stage 11, I think it is, in, within that, uh, step 11, that it, the design of the house, and you mentioned, you know, and obviously what you said in relation to internal design and uniform specifications, why can't we have just an external design? Let's have four or five types, that's it, and do it. Well, why can't we do that? I mean, that, that's just a choice of materials, and in fact that will be covered within the specifications, so it's just a choice. No, but I'm talking about, not talking about material. Uh, Sarah, I'm talking about the design of the houses, right? That we have a three bedroomed house and we have maybe three or four designs for the state, work away. You know, give them to the local authorities, give them the money and let them off and let them do it. Why can't we do that? Well, that's Why can't we have a uniform design? Well, that is the, land commission, the Land Commission had three types of houses, right? And they're all over the state, in every county in the state. Councils use uniform designs right across. And if you go back, that's how they got large scale social housing built. That's how they got done in the 30s. Okay. That's how they got done in the, in the 50s. Very briefly before we move on. If, um, it's maybe not in, in the area of no, we, climate. Yes. So we may, you, you may go back to the... Maybe the, question the, the, on, the question on public buildings wasn't answered. Okay. Just in relation to the electric vehicle charging points and public buildings and government okay. buildings. It was... And apartment, was apartment dome property. In relation to the charging points, I think that was answered earlier by Mr. Is there a plan? No, sp no, specifically in relation. That was in relation to housing developments, in relation to, to government buildings and public buildings. It was, I think, park, yeah. car parks. And yeah. So, um, yeah. just maybe just a few points. So, just the current requirement in the directive is for uh, non-residential buildings with more than 10 parking spaces inside or adjacent. But it does give some exemptions or kind of optional exemptions. Uh, for uh, small to medium enterprises and it also gives exemptions for public sector buildings that are covered by a different directive um, and it, those those public sector buildings are addressed under that different directive I, just it's the energy efficiency directive and it's managed uh, by DK so in terms of the energy performance buildings directive it refers out to a different directive um, that's managed by DK for public sector uh, buildings and existing buildings are by 2025 isn't that the other yes the other existing points? buildings yeah, are you answered 20 that 20 already yes yeah. but, but the regulation needs to be in place by march 2025 to be helpful to deputy stanley i mean the the public buildings and what and i suppose 
energy efficiency and all that in, in, in public buildings and um, is uh, the, obviously the Office of Public Works has a, has a, a lead role in it and I think they're, they're possibly coming before the committee in the, yes, next, yeah. uh, in the next week or two so yeah. it, it might be an opportunity then to, to, to talk to them in Thank you. To, Deputy Lahart. Thank have you. I, uh, how much time have, have Five I? minutes. Five. Great. Um, just for the record, even though it's not to do with climate change, I'd be appalled at restricting ourselves to three or four designs of public housing. Um, uh, there are some great, uh, in my own county, South Dublin County, I'm trying to, uh, Byrne was the architect, was a JP or JT, um, but won uh, many architectural awards, going back, he designed Carnegie libraries and, and uh, local authority houses using uh, quite uh, innovative architectural techniques. And I think the architecture needs to take into account context. So that, that, that just have a serious issue with that. Um, something kind of Stalinist in the, in the kind of design, of just having three or four housing designs, given the scale of social housing going to build. So I have some random thoughts. And thanks for your attendance today and your public service. Um, and they're going to roam uh, cycle parking facilities. Um, as a local authority member for many years, I think it's overlooked in a pretty serious way. And we tend to locate cycle, cycle parking outside of uh, residential buildings as opposed to within, and certainly outside of commercial and business buildings. I don't see why they shouldn't be incorporated within. I think it would encourage a lot more use of it. Um, in the city, for example, there's only one uh, Drury Street, I think, car park where you can park your bike free gratis. So I think we need to, you know, as we're encouraging and moving towards more people using bicycles, I think you need to put your stamp on this as a planning authority or as, a, as the uh, planning department in terms of encouraging, not encouraging, mandating local authorities, uh, particularly in urban areas, to start providing for this. I was in Utrecht with a colleague recently, they have the biggest bicycle, bicycle park in the world. It was a really impressive uh, right in the, the heart of the city. Um, there's two, one theme that I want to come back to, you talk about reusing existing building stock, um, encouraging the use and reuse of buildings in an urban, urban and rural areas, and influencing transformational change in the pattern of development and settlement by securing more compact growth. So they're all kind of interrelated. So my, you know, everything's local, but um, Paul Hogan, we sat on opposite sides of uh, a chamber for a number of years in South Dublin, um, and he was very highly esteemed by both uh, uh, his colleagues and by elected representatives. Um, when we were going through the last development plan there, there are quite mature areas of my constituency, in every constituency, where you have incredibly long back gardens. Um, in the city, they tended to, uh, in quite a number of cases, to be used for the development of Mews buildings. I think it's allowed for under the development plans, but, but the public aren't aware of it. You know, I'd have this gardens in my constituency be 120, 150, 200 feet long. And um, I presume that's the kind of, that ties into some of the compact growth that you're talking about because you're using existing land, existing facilities, existing utilities, existing roads, transport, schools, etc. Um, and the much maligned granny flat idea in the last week, I wouldn't like to see that just binned because, again, uh, I would say there's probably, I'll just throw out a figure, but there's probably one in five houses in my constituency that, that is an empty nest. Um, very often because there isn't an alternative to trade down within the existing area. Um, and, uh, but that is something, if the public aren't aware of, I, I, I would favour a scheme would have to be incentivised where someone could look at the opportunity of... Um, keep it to climate issues, sorry Deputy. Yeah, okay. I know they're very pressing issues which you're, mentioned, which you're bringing up, but I'm just afraid that it's drifting into the general housing um, Yeah, no, I, okay, and I, I don't want to do that, but it was in relation to uh, this, this, the, the idea of securing compact growth. I mean, if we want the city to expand just within the boundaries of the M50, and I subscribe to that, and not stretch to Port Leash, um, then I think these are some of the things that we need to look at. Um, High-rise designated areas in Dublin, look, I, I uh, agree with you in relation to that. Um, we were talking to a geographer in UCD, and again, the public, it was the first time I became aware of it, that because we're a northern hemisphere city, the sun is quite low in the sky, so, so there are only certain places you can go high-rise without blocking out 
the sunlight from the entire city and there's a bit of education needed around that but I would like your view on the fact that there are designated five or six designated high-rise areas again this is into the compact growth uh, so designated areas in the city that just nothing seems to have happened there uh, if you have a view on what needs to be done to encourage that Thank you. Um, might have one more point. Do you want them to answer this and let you back in to think of your last question? That's if very you fair, Chair. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. yeah. You want to start with any of those in whatever okay, order? Thank, uh, thank you, uh, Deputy. Um, sorry, I should have, um, in, in concluding with, uh, with um, Deputy Stanley, thank you, Chair. Um, uh, just to, to clarify, I mean, when what Sarah was talking about was uh, uh, internal internal um, layouts and specs were very, very, were very, very clear, and I, I don't think local authorities would particularly thank us for uh, imposing a very limited number of external uh, designs on uh, on local authority housing. I mean, what you see from the outside. In a house, um, it does very much have to take into account context and location, um, and I think we've seen some very creative um, designs coming forward from local authorities um, that uh, others in, in private housing development have uh, have latched onto. So I certainly wouldn't want anything that we do to try to sort of standardise and to streamline processes to, in some way, kind of curtail kind of creativity and good design. Um, uh, which, which is not what we're not what we're about. Um, I might ask, um, seeing as the, my, seeing as your former uh, planner deputy, that we poached in the department is held in such uh, in such high esteem. I might ask him maybe to come in and talk to us a little bit on the compact growth piece, but maybe just to say a few uh, a few general words in relation to that. Uh, on your cycling uh, strategy point, um, uh, I don't disagree with you at all in relation to that. I think we would we would look forward to, and Paul might be able to, to say a bit more on this to. Um, Minister Nocton's department in terms of a rollout of a, of a broader cycling strategy, we would look for, to, to that to sort of inform planning policies and approaches in development plans that would then facilitate that um, uh, as part of a, an overall national strategy. So we'd certainly be very, uh, be very keen on that. Um, whether, uh, whether it's long, uh, long gardens or, uh, or otherwise, I think the point that you make is, is, is essentially what, uh, what we're about when we talk about compact, compact growth. If there are if there are buildings that are underutilised, if there are areas of land that are, uh, are underutilised, um, we really that is what we are trying to do is to actually prioritise those for development, so that the the carpet of development and the rollout of the carpet of development doesn't continue. It actually becomes more concentrated, as you say, in areas where there already are established services that can be um, can be uh, relied on uh, to support them. Uh, I, I won't dwell on the on the on the granny flat um, uh, piece, but I, I, I mean, we did recognise when Rebuilding Ireland was published back in um, uh, in just two years ago. We did recognise uh, one of the five pillars of Rebuilding Ireland is around um, how we utilise the existing housing stock, and we are, we were very conscious of the fact that there are. Um, and this is very I know I don't want to stray into territory that the chair is keeping me out of, but but it is it is important from the the compact growth point of view and how we actually plan better so that that uh, can influence positively what's happening from an emissions point of view. Uh, we were very, very conscious that there are, um, inevitably, in, in any um, country, there are um, houses that are underutilised just by virtue of life cycle. So we did put in place a, uh, a competition which was uh, designed to, uh, to bring forward uh, a, a proposal or a concept that would look at um, uh, what might be called a sort of empty nest type of uh, type of home, and how it could actually be modified to um, for an older person uh, to continue living in the ground floor, which makes sense obviously from their own point of view in terms of mobility and all that, uh, but perhaps um, convert to the upper floor into um, a self-contained unit. Uh, we conducted that competition and the uh, project that won through on that is now moving on to sort of concept uh, uh, testing stage in, um, uh, in a house in 
Clondalkin. Uh, so I think there's going to be a lot of learning come out of that, and um, uh, incentives at all aside, I think that learning, even in itself, and the, and the promotion of that learning, uh, could be hugely important in terms of um, supporting people who might want to. This is not about. Uh, we've had previous. We've had previous discussions where it's been sort of. Are we forcing people to? That's not what it's about. It's really trying to support and facilitate. Yeah, and respecting the fabric of the area Absol as well. Without ab like, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, uh, okay, I suppose just generally, uh, very briefly, in terms of, of high rise, I suppose high rise is uh, is ultimately a sort of a, a relative concept, and sometimes uh, maybe it's better to talk in terms of higher rise because there are probably locations in parts of our our main cities where we're we're still fundamentally two story two story housing. Um, even going to three or four stories in those sort of locations, that's not high. That's not high rise in, in many people's minds, but it's certainly higher and a better uh, and, a be and potentially a better and more efficient use of land with all of the the, the climate benefits flowing uh, flowing from that. So, I suppose it just to, to make that point, when, people, when we talk about high rise, people automatically sometimes assume that we're talking about 20 or 30 storey towers uh, in uh, uh, all over the place. Um, that's that's not the case. It's it's more the higher the relative um, concept and how we can move from what is a, uh, a very low-rise scenario to something that makes uh, makes better use of land and provides us with a way of actually achieving what the NPF provides for. But maybe, Paul, you're, you're more uh, more expert in this than, than I am, so you might want to just say a few words on that. Just, just again, very briefly, on the uh, parking issue, uh, the bicycle parking issue, it is an area that, that there is good guidance on from the National uh, Transport Authority, and it's something that is finding its way into development plans as they've been reviewed. And certainly, um, we would have uh, included in, in, in the apartment guidelines that were recently reviewed um, more stringent or more more generous uh, off-street uh, parking standards for bicycles, you know, within within the buildings, e even in cases where perhaps car parking was 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 is now optional or is, is not necessary, depending on, on where the location is. So. You know, that's recognising obviously that apartment dwellers and where apartments should be built are more likely to be to be bicycle based or are using bicycles. Um, we're also due to update the, the national development plan guidelines, you know, for, from our own department's perspective. And certainly, we would be seeking to incorporate the latest, um, you know, be best practice thinking from the NTA, who, who are quite expert on, on these matters. Um, you know, beyond as well, just kind of residential or workplace standards. Lo looking at, uh, as you cited, the example of, of, of city and town centres where, where people might might park their their bike and, and bring it. Um, on the second point you raised, the, the kind of reuse of, of building stock and, and compact growth, I think there's, there's different scales that we're, we're getting at there. I think the biggest gains probably are to be made looking at places like, you know, former industrial estates closer to the city, where you know people can actually, you know, cycle or take public transport or, or have things like Lewis near them. Um, and what we're getting at there is, you know, by, by increasing um, in modest increases in density, as John has said, um, we, we can achieve quite quite significant changes. Um, it, it's trickier, as, as we know from our from our former discussions and deliberations in, in, in the suburban areas, where you have an established character, and, and obviously existing residents are quite concerned about change. But I think the the, the kind of the, an incremental element of change is probably okay, and, and I think. The issue I think that, that you and I had discussed before uh, at the county development plan stage was was you know a proportion of an area being acceptable to change you know based on subdivision and it was it wasn't necessarily granny flats it was just subdivision generally and you, you get that in, in other in other cities um, so I think that's something that that that, that does merit uh, looking at further um, particularly where you have things like large gardens and, and, and cars aren't an, a necessity in all cases so it does depend on location and it requires more work uh, but again something we, we, we would I suppose in, in, in the role now in the department, we'd, we'd be a better place to, to look at. Um, the, the, the last issue then, obviously, high rise and sunlight. Well, obviously, um, you know, the, that, 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 that's a more complex issue. Um, to a certain extent, um, there's different forces at play in those locations. Uh, the designated areas in the city are, are, are of interest, but, but from a commercial as opposed to a residential perspective in the main. 
And there's also there was a degree of uncertainty, I think, around building height, uh, you know, because of local development plan standards. So, one of the benefits of the imminent publication of the guidance on height for, from from the department will will be to offer that that de degree of um, certainty or flexibility, depending on, on, on what's required. Uh, but it will provide then um, guidance for decisions to be made in the future. I missed the, yeah, yeah, missed the percentage when you said what percentage of housing stock is over 40 years old? Social housing stock? Social housing stock, I think it was 40, 30%, 30 was it? Sorry, 30%, 40,000, 40, 40, 40, yeah. 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 Uh, uh, two other things. Uh, in the state of Massachusetts, I think it's probably the leader in terms of building regulations in the states. Um, they have regulations around hot water coming to the taps that it has to, uh, came back, came into the last two or three years, that from the moment you turn on your tap, hot water must arrive to the spout within something like eight seconds. And it was only when I heard that that I realised, my God, how much water we waste waiting for it to get hot. How much water, how much cleansed water uh, just goes down the sink. Uh, have we any plans or what's the best practice standard in relation to that? And then a rider question on it is in relation to just the cleansing, cleansed water that we still use in our bathroom, in our flushes, the cost of, of cleansing, and yet it's not used for it's, uh, it's not used for, um, we haven't separated the system of water going into houses yet. We still spend enormous amounts of money cleaning water, regardless of whether it's going to be used as in a flush system, in a bathroom system, or as drinking water from the, the sink. I might, if you want to come in on that briefly, or does anyone want to deal with that? If you feel it's not your air, area, we can... We can get clarification from somewhere else. If it's well, I, I think just one thing on Partel uh, NZEP, what we've found with apartment blocks is that uh, we've improved the fabric a lot um, and there isn't much uh, a great space heat uh, demand. And what we're finding is that 80% 80 of the energy use in apartment blocks is down to hot water. So what we've introduced in the new NZEP standard is in the calculation methodology, we give a credit for efficient hot water use. So if you uh, install efficient showers or efficient taps uh, for hot water use, you'll get a credit in the calculation methodology uh, for NZEP. The developer? Uh, the, the purchaser? The, 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 the dwelling, the performance dwelling. of the dwelling. Oh, right, okay. Okay. Will okay. Terms yeah, right. compliance yeah. with the... Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so we're, we've introduced a credit there for efficient hot water use okay. in, Thank in you. dwellings. Thank you very much. I'm going to move on to Senator O'Sullivan. Yes, Thank you. Um, just, I, I just want to um, uh, support what uh, Deputy Marcella Cork and, uh, Kennedy was saying with regard to communication around Met Erin. And I was thinking of the area of phenology, you know, where plants and species, where it's a tool, a communication tool. Uh, met Aaron, you know, and it, um, I think it could serve as a good way to, to bring the public on board with regard to climate change. And I think if it's something that's done on a monthly basis, we'll have missed all of those storms that are passing. It'll, it's something that will have to happen on a daily basis. And I'm mean, just reading on the phone there that um, uh, last night eight people died in Mallorca from uh, severe flooding and that, you know, so this is something, we're here with the task that it requires urgency and um, I think that we have to apply that in how we go uh, forward as a state and as a nation and I think we, you know, we're losing opportunities as we saw in the budget last night. But anyway, just get on with some questions. Um, it did come up in the last meeting about getting minutes from your interdepartmental meetings. So uh, Eamon, Deputy Ryan talked about the memo, but if there was anything that you thought uh, that could support us in this process because we only have until January to come up with a report. If we could have access to any minutes of uh, cross departmental, interdepartmental meetings with regard to climate change, that would be very, very useful. So we're up to speed. Um, uh, with regard to mitigation, what provisions have been made at the moment uh, in, um, with regard to housing in low-lying areas uh, that are on uh, flood zones? So like with the winter coming up, um, you know, where we can potentially have some severe weather. So what is being done to mitigate? So housing in low-lying areas, not new builds, but the current stock that's on the low-lying areas, given that we have, we have uh, sea level rise and we know that it is happening. Um, with regard to uh, uh, peatlands, who's responsible for peatlands? Which department? Uh, current total peatland emissions is about 9 
metric tonnes a year. So what is the potential reduction in peatland emissions? Um, so uh, there's a national peatland strategy, uh, but when it comes to re-wetting uh, degraded peatlands, it's almost uh, aspirational. Um, so when will we have a coherent plan to reduce peatland emissions with action to be taken to re-wet bogs? Um, no one has spoken about peatlands today, but there is an issue around um, greenhouse gases and uh, peatlands and methane. Um, social housing refit, uh, you said 50% of our social housing has been refitted in phase one. Um, so what uh, BER ratings were achieved? And if it is only uh, phase one, does that mean that in order to do deep retrofitting that you're going to have to go back to all that stock again and go through the next phase? And I just question the efficiency of that, why you wouldn't do it at, at, in the, the, the first run, uh, do it and complete it, and th then it's uh, over. Um, also, with regard to uh, private rented, uh, rented housing, um, are there any policy measures to drive refit in the private uh, rented housing? And um, have standards been revised to introduce a minimum BER for rented housing? And then uh, with regard to the, the um, Project Ireland and the, um, uh, the impact, uh, climate impact, there was no climate impact assessment done uh, with regard to Project Ireland before it was announced. And then the EPA projections up to 2035 were announced after 2040, the Project 2040 was launched, so it couldn't be included. And now we have the IPC's report from yesterday. Um, so again, um, what assessment is being carried out with all this recent information available? And uh, if there is assessment, um, or any uh, reports that we would have access to them as soon as possible. The last uh, question, Chair, is the offshore renewable option. So I attended a meeting just a, a week ago in WIT in Waterford with Minister Damien English and Philip Nugent was present, and uh, they were launching the Maritime Planning Framework Baseline Report. And my question to the Department is, are we going to have to wait until mid-2019, until that draft is published, before we see the Maritime Area and Foreshore Bill coming forward? So we have such potential with offshore. We know that from the other evidence we have had um, in the last uh, meetings. But this is such a huge opportunity for Ireland. So when are we going to get, see the legislation to facilitate it? Are we going to have to wait for the marine planning framework, or is it going to come before that? Thank you, Thank you. Senator, for that list of questions. Uh, just in relation to the peatlands, we're going to have Board Namona in here as well before us, and they may have more information on that, as well as the Department of Agriculture. Just, I'm not sure about your own department in relation to that, but you can answer those in any order you wish. Okay. Thank you, Chair. And thank you, uh, Senator. Um, uh, peatlands is, um, uh, is probably a department of, uh, of agri agriculture dimension to it, but it is uh, it's department of uh, Minister Nocton's department um, in the in the lead in relation to what, as you say, if Board Namona are are coming in, no doubt they will have uh, they will certainly have something to say in relation to it. In terms of flooding, uh, Senator, I suppose there's, there's two elements that, in terms of um, developments that are in flood uh, flood risk areas, uh, whether they're whether they're housing or whether they're commercial or other uh, commercial or other developments, um, the Office of Public Works uh, is obviously um, taking as a, a significant programme of flood, uh, flood relief and flood protection works um, that it's um, uh, rolling out through the, uh, through the uh, CFRAMS, I think is the acronym for their, their programme. In terms of planning, uh, uh, development in areas potentially prone to, uh, prone to, to, to planning, uh, to to flooding. Sorry, excuse me, uh, Paul. Do you want to just say a few words in relation to uh, in relation to that? Um, this, sorry, in, in relation in relation to flood um, uh, planning uh, for um, development on flood uh, oh, yeah, uh, flood plains. Yes, yeah, so there are rel relatively recent guidelines again uh, published by our department in, in consultation with the, or sorry, in, in association with the Office of Public Works. Uh, for, for, for planning in areas of, 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 of uh, flood risk, and there's a, there's a you know there's a there's a process for both uh, 
zoning of land and development plans and assessing of planning applications um, you know in, in, uh, on a case by case basis so stock that's on the low lying areas in, in, in terms of de dealing with, with what's going to happen when the next flood comes around in November and we have a storm predicted now onshore south winds uh, this weekend you know we know the sea level's rising. We know that we have housing and families living in low-lying areas. So what's going to happen? Well, there, there, there obviously has been a, a program of, of, of uh, flood improvement works, you know, depending on, on where the risk is greatest. So we have seen in places like Cork and Clonmel, the OPW implement those sort of uh, schemes. And that, that, that process continues in, 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 in relevant areas. Uh, in, in the long term, you know, the, the, the the strategy that we mentioned, you know, does include barriers or barrages, and you know, where necessary, because the reality is, all of our cities are, are, are built on estuaries and uh, floodplains. That, that's the nature of them, and I think, um, you know, it's, it's it's a reality that has to be has to be considered. Um, clearly, it's it's um, it, it'll be an ongoing issue. David, a retro I'll, I'll go back to Mr. McCarthy and you can... Yeah, in terms of, um, uh, obviously, just a, maybe just a one for, further issue on the, the flood um, uh, issue that the, the Senator raised, obviously one of the things that we are, are working on, it's, it's a four to five year project, again with Met Aaron, uh, and Met Aaron working with the OPW, is to develop a flood, uh, a more robust flood forecasting capability. So um, we're in a process at the moment to expand Metairn's uh, expertise uh, into the area of um, hydrogeology and, 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 uh, and building and developing that capacity. There's a huge amount of modelling work that will have to actually be done in order to bring that to, to a reality. So it is going to be a four to five year project, but that is something that we are, uh, we are working on as, uh, as well. Um, in terms of, uh, sorry, you, uh, Senator, you at the start you mentioned the uh, the Project Ireland uh, delivery board. I've, I've no doubt those minutes from uh, Deep Power, who I think are, are they coming into the committee, um, uh, those minutes will be publicly available as, as any document would. But I don't, I don't want to say there's any there's no mystique in relation to this. We've had four meetings of the delivery board thus far, and it has really been taking the I don't have it in front of me, but the the NPF document and trying to work our way through what are the, the things that we need to roll out and to make sure are progressing in the way that the, the NPF would have envisaged. So, for example, I mentioned earlier the regional spatial and economic strategies. Those are critically important in, mo in moving those on. So they've been, uh, they've been the subject of, uh, of one of our uh, discussions. One of the others that may be of, uh, of direct relevance, there were four funds provided for under the... Um, uh, under Project Ireland 2040, and one of them is a, uh, a climate fund, um, as well as our own urban regeneration development fund. So again, talking about how we can move those on so that we can actually get the, 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 the available funding deployed and get projects of relevance funded as uh, as quickly as we uh, as quickly as we can. In terms of um, retrofitting in the residential stock generally, again, that is the, the Department of. There's, there's two angles to this. We set the performance standards, so performance standards that apply for new dwellings and performance standards that apply when dwellings are being renovated. But the piece uh, that uh, I suppose where, where in, uh, Minister Nocton's department I is leading on is what are the, the measures, the incentives, etc., that might need to be put in place in order to bring forward retrofitting we can't through the, the building regulations we can't force people to do uh, to do renovations but we set the standards that need to be achieved when those renovations are being done but there is a broader issue around the economics and the, the supports available to, to, to encourage people uh, either in the home ownership sector or indeed in the private rented sector to bring forward um, renovation uh, reno renovation projects in terms of the national planning framework there was this in terms of the, so you know, the, from what I understand, um, you, you have um, the phase one, and then like the deep. I suppose I'm getting to the yep. deep retrofit, so that the the, the, the stick gets in there and with the grants and all yep. the incentives, and they do the full thorough job yep. in one run, as opposed to bits and pieces. Mm. We do this, such amount this 
year and then next year you have to go back and you do it, it deeper. So I'm just, we, in terms of efficiencies yeah. and scale. Yeah, I was, I, was, I was just about to, to come to that because it's, it's, it's slightly different, the, po the point that I was making in relation to the housing stock generally and how retrofits can be, can be encouraged. Um, those are, um, uh, uh, Minister Nocton's department is leading, uh, leading on those in terms of the social housing stock though. That falls, we are the, uh, through the local authorities, we are the, the custodians of, uh, of that part of the housing stock. So we are involved and support the, uh, the, the retrofitting process there. I mean, phase one uh, retrofitting um, was really designed to, um, to use the limited resources that uh, would have been available back in, in 2013 when we started out in this in order to try and get um, as much um, attic and cavity wall insulation works done as we possibly could um, from a, a comfort and a, a um, fuel poverty point of view as much as uh, as much as anything uh, as much as anything else um, but it was uh, it was very clear I mean the, the the level of funding available was was such that it would have uh, it would have only covered those uh, basic but nonetheless important works in terms of as I say fuel poverty and and comfort phase two is going to be a much um, deeper um, uh, exercise, and while we have to, we're still working on finalising the, the arrangements for phase two. Uh, our ambition in terms of phase two will be to achieve a B, B, B2 BER for those uh, those social housing units. And as I said earlier, the 30% of our stock that is more than 40 years old is where we will be targeting um, our uh, certainly our initial efforts most uh, most at you know because they are the ones that need this deep level of retrofit um, most in terms of the national planning framework there was a strate strategic environmental assessment of the npf was completed and the environmental report is published and is is publicly available so that's that, that is, that's available to to anybody who uh, who wishes to access it um, on MAFA and the, the, the sorry, sorry, I shouldn't use acronyms, the Maritime Area and Foreshore Amendment Bill, and the Marine Spatial Planning, they're they're obviously connected, but they're moving on they're moving on parallel tracks. So really, the the Maritime Area Bill, um, uh, I think it was Senator Lumber maybe earlier on, um, where we are on that is we are awaiting legal advice from the Attorney General's office, um, uh, and as soon as we get that. Um, and have a chance to assess it. That will determine. We'll obviously move on uh, with that bill as quickly as we possibly can. But I can't say how, what the timeline for it is actually going to be until we get the legal advice and can see what sort of issues it uh, it presents for us. And the last question: Can you set the BER standard for uh, rented properties? Um, the, there isn't. A, I mean. The, the performance standards I mean, that we set in the building regulations, if a renovation was being undertaken and it, um, uh, it, it was a, a rental property in the same way as if it was an owner-occupied property, the performance standard would have to be achieved. But I don't think it's a, a, a requirement or a, something that we, can, we can't mandate people to, uh, to, to retrofit their properties. Um, it's, it is going to be more an issue for Minister Nocton's department around how we can actually encourage people to actually do that. I suppose it's just the same problem arises for those rented as those in social housing in terms of fuel poverty and, um, you know, a, again, um, a high standard for yep. comfortable living. As indeed living. part of the owner-occupied stock as well. So, yep. yeah, yep. It, it would be good. That's great. Thank you very much, Senator. I'm going to bring in Deputy Pringle. Thanks, Chairman. Um, I must say that Manus and Auckland's department are going to be very busy after all this. Because <laughs> it seems to be, maybe we should have them back again. Yeah. Um, I must say, it's been very interesting. Uh, it's been kind of depressing as well, I must say. Um, initially, your report, that the, or the, the submission that you gave here, made very good reading, read very well. It's actually a work of fiction. Um, it reads as if this is fantastic, but it's not. When you get down to it, then it's not really doesn't come out that way at all. Like, so I'm going to be the I think the fourth TD to ask the question now in relation to the refurbishment of the existing stock. Now you've outlined that there's 30 percent of the stock is over 50 years old. You've outlined that there's going to be to B two or B plus standard that you're going to refurbish the stock to. So I'm going to ask you, how much is that going to cost? 
because you, you're not given a time frame, you won't give a time frame, and you won't say how long it's going to be. You say it depends on the budgetary process. But let's say, so you, you have to know then how much it's going to cost. So let, tell us how much it will cost, and then we, we can see how long it's going to take from that. And then in, the, in relation to that's in that one. And in relation then to the uh, offshore wind, I think I'm going to be the third TD to be asking about this. When did you ask for the legal advice? I just asked if you could tell me that. Um, then, in relation to oh yeah, the, the role of the local authorities and the um, the temporary. Uh, Energy uh, body, I can't remember the exact name of it, but you said again that it would be the Department of Communications, Energy and Public uh, Climate Change that would be responsible for rolling out, whether they would be rolled out around other local authorities. What role do you actually have in terms of local authorities? And that there, I just wonder if you could expand on that because it seems to me that you don't have, actually have any role. Um, so if you'd expand on that, because I think. It's, 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 be very interesting to hear, but surely you, as being the governing body of local authorities, could actually instruct local authorities to roll out and dysfunction. Okay, they might have to go to the Department of Climate Change to look for funding to do it, but surely you could instruct them to actually do it. I mean, you do provide circulars, you do set regulations, you do do planning guidelines. Uh, all have to be consistent with the national planning framework. Um, you do have the role of reviewing local authority development plans. You do have more penalties under your department, I think, as well. You know, you're in charge of development and everything. So you must have some role in terms of whether the local authorities will actually deal with this structure. Um, then, in relation to Part L and uh, the future proofing of housing and that, they, like, you've talked, you said that it has been around for, or that you've been flagged up these changes for a number of years since 2006, I think, or maybe like, the last 10 years or something. Um, I went on Donegal County Council's website um, yesterday, just when preparing for this meeting, to have a look at the current housing applications that are there in terms of planning applications. And just for out of nine applications that I looked at, just briefly in the time that I had, it covered 11 houses. Only one of those houses would comply with the regulations that you're talking about. Every other, as far as I can make out now, and maybe I could be wrong on this, you, and you'll, you'll advise me whether I am or not, but 10 out of, out of those 11 houses, 10 of them had at least two chimneys in the house. Now, as I understand it, that wouldn't comply with the regulations that you're talking about. That is, it would be, so they, they have solid fuel heating. So, I mean, if we've been preparing for this for 10 years, why is that the situation that this, that's, that's happening? And these are applications that haven't been decided yet by Donegal County Council. You know, so why is that happening? And what is the role of your department if that's, if that's the case? Um, and the last question is, oh yeah, you said that 63% um, of all capital spending on climate change is non-exchequer funding. So where will the, 37, the other 37% come from, and what, how much of it is your department's funding? Um, uh, how will it be spent? And uh, yeah, and oh yeah, the other one then in relation to rural Ireland and rural areas. What do you, what like, you know? We want to encourage people not to develop rural areas. Basically, uh, you know, it's been used as an excuse here and how we can't comply with climate change because we have rural type development. But you're actually not doing anything to encourage people to move into towns and villages, even small towns and villages like in and around my area or any area of the country. There's nothing to be done, done there in terms of encouraging development to take place, encouraging people, maybe encourage people to develop in the town and to, as an alternative to developing outside the, the areas. What has actually been done in the terms of that, and uh, do you have a role, if any, in relation to that as well? Thanks. Thanks. Um, Mr McCarthy, do you want to take that? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator. Um, uh, just to, to start with, um, I'd obviously uh, I wouldn't agree that my opening statement is a work of fiction, um, uh, and uh, just to so make sure that uh, that's uh, that's recorded. Um, 
I think the question that I was asked um, uh, previously was in relation to the retrofitting programme. Um, how long would it take? And I honestly said that would depend on the resources that were available. Um, you, what you've asked me, uh, Deputy, I think is a, is a slightly different but obviously related question, which is uh, how much would it cost? Um, our estimate at the moment, so we're still finalising the, the, the phase two work, but our estimate is that it will probably cost somewhere between 20 and 30,000 euros per unit. Globally, overall. So if we're talking about 40,000 uh, 40, units, then that would be somewhere between 800 million and 1.2 billion euros. So, so 800 billion. Yeah. Um, uh, in terms of uh, local authorities and our relationship with local authorities, this is an issue that um, uh, we, we, we deal with and we get, we get raised with us quite, uh, quite a bit. I mean, if you go back 20 years ago, virtually all local authority functions were, um, all of the significant local authority functions were at central government level, rested in, in the department, what was then the Department of the Environment and local government. Uh, but the landscape has changed massively since then. So roads went to one department, community development went to another department, environment has gone to another department. So just so that we're, we're clear in relation to our role, we don't instruct local authorities what to do in relation to roads. We don't instruct local authorities what to do in relation to energy. We don't have that responsibility. The Department of Transport looks after the roads programme and deals directly with local authorities in relation to that. So, I mean, if, if I was to do as you suggest, which is to instruct local authorities to do something in the energy space and tell them to go to Dennis Nocton's department to get the money for it, that, makes, that just doesn't make sense. That's not the way... That wouldn't actually achieve anything because I would be instructing the local authorities to take an action in the energy space that I'm not qualified or competent to, to actually do. So that's why it's for Minister Nocton's department to roll out. As I say, at a general level, I made clear at the start, we are very keen to see local authorities be a strong vehicle for dealing with a whole range of public functions at, at local level. But they have multiple relationships back to the centre, not just to us, but to Dennis Nocton's department. To so what is your role in terms of local authorities? Our role in relation to local authorities is to ensure that they have the necessary legislation uh, and the necessary broad funding arrangements in place to discharge their general, uh, their general functions. But when it comes to a roads programme, we don't fund the roads programme. So the people who have a, a policy perspective in relation to roads are in the Department of Transport. So we would have no engagement with local authorities in relation to, uh, in relation to roads. If, however, the Department of Transport wanted to take the remaining functions of roads that local authorities discharge, if they wanted to take that off local authorities, then we would certainly have uh, an interest in that because that wouldn't, be, uh, that wouldn't fit within the broad policy framework which is in place that local authorities should continue to discharge significant functions at local level. So that's just to, to, to clarify in relation to, uh, in relation to that. Um, so, basically, so basically just what you're saying is that you have no role in terms of if local authorities want to roll out in terms of being the local information person for renewable energy or anything like that. You have no role in relation to that. We would, we would certainly encourage local, author, uh, local authorities to be creative and to be progressive. And but I could encourage the local authorities to be creative and progressive too, but that means nothing, Nick. Well, Do you have, you have no role in it? We have a role in ensuring that if we have a general, as we do, a central if you like, governance and development role in relation to local authorities as to do we want their functions to narrow or do we want their functions to be, uh, to be broad. We want local government to be a broad vehicle for delivery of services locally. So that's why we would encourage local authorities to take opportunities of this kind. But we don't have the competence to tell them what is it they should be doing in that place because we're not energy experts and we don't have the funding for it. Those things come through Minister Nocton's department. Deputy, are you referring to like a one-stop shop that was mentioned in this committee a number of weeks ago? Yeah, it was mentioned by yeah. a number of different members. Yeah, it was, it was raised in this committee that the lo that local authorities would be like a one-stop shop for private householders that they would go in and get information on retrofitting, for example. It was raised here as part of our discussions. Yeah, that you'd be the, the kind of trusted no. intermediary between um, private householders who want to avail of retrofitting. Yeah. But it's not that we don't have a role in it. I'm simply honest, honestly answering the question. I, am, I don't have the knowledge to know 
what is it is required in order to roll out that sort of information in relation to retrofitting. Mm -hmm. That rests in Minister Nocton's department. So, so if I was to say that local authorities should do X, Y or Z, I would be speaking from a point of, uh, from a perspective that isn't fully informed. So you have no role in it. That, that's what I'm asking you. Like. Okay. Not, not, at the moment, uh, not at the moment, but that was something that we were looking at that maybe there could be, as, with their interaction with the Department of Communications, Climate Action and Environment, working with the, the local authorities, that your governments, it's a proposal that may come from our committee. No, it's not happening at the moment, but that's something that we could look at as a committee as one of our recommendations. I know that came up for discussion but, here, but one, it's not happening at the moment. Can one department not look at it to another department? Yeah, that's what we would, I would recommend, my personal view. But and we I'm have sure to tell them to look at it. Yeah, we'd have All to right, look okay. at measures ourselves. I'm going to, uh, no, sorry, no, I had you other questions, sorry. Yeah, no, yeah, there's more to be asked, answered. You just could you I know, just, I've asked uh, them already. But are there other questions there, or do you want to just remind them briefly? Just give there was the a question about the offshore wind. There was a question about um, the 63% capital spending as well. And Sorry, could you just help me on the 63% capital, capital spending? Well, so, so the 63% of capital spending is on climate as non exchequer funding. So of the 37% alternative, where will that come from and how will it be spent? Or maybe that's not relevant to yourself either. Sorry, sorry, Deputy. Where, okay. Where are you? Well, could you answer the question on the offshore wind farms? Which was the, the legal advice. Uh, we when have, did you ask for it? We have been engaging with the Attorney General's Office. I'll come back to the committee with the with the precise timeline on this. But I think we've been engaging with the Attorney General's Office for probably 12 months in relation to it. But this has been going on for like for about five years, this offshore wind thing. I mean, Andy Kenny answered questions in the Dáil when he was Taoiseach years ago about it. And the, the, the process has been moving on. We, we published it, we de developed a general scheme, we put that out to, uh, to public consultation, there was pre-legislative scrutiny in relation to it, and the process as it moved on gave rise to legal issues which we needed to get legal advice on and we've been engaging on those. If there's any kind of time frame around that, maybe you could send that on to us after. I don't uh, know absolutely. If can. But as I said earlier, yeah. the time frame for moving, uh, for moving it on will be dependent on what on the, the legal, legal advice, advice yeah, Could you that. outline what the, could you maybe outline as well what the issues are? Uh, I don't really no. want to get into the in, into the legal into the legal issues at this stage, but I will, when we come back, when we get legal when we get legal advice in relation to uh, the issues that we have raised and we have a better sense of a pathway forward, I'll certainly come back to the committee with a, with Thank an update in relation to the issues. Thank Jeremy, you. Ask, the, the issues the issues that have been the subject of the legal advice, we we can't ask what they are. You can, you can certainly ask. They're, they're tricky and they're, and they're detailed and I prefer not to get into them, but I will come back to the committee with further information to the extent that I can. Yeah, I don't know how, how it could take a number of years to arrive at it. Well, we'll ask the Secretary General to come back to us on that, on those legal issues, when you can and, yeah, and first with a written, a written response on that. Is that it, Deputy? Yeah. yeah thank you. Uh, Senator Devine. Uh, well, um, thank you very much. Um, just one, two, three, four, four, some reflections and some questions. Um, human positive spaces um, for well-being. I've, I've done a document on it and I know there's some guys in UCD also as well and maybe Paul you'd be able to answer it because I think it's within the planning uh, regulations and as essential when people, when firms or construction firms or just ordinary houses are uh, submitting planning permission. It's to do with I suppose providing more natural environments within our cities given that we've now cities are have 50 percent of our population and it's projected that by within the next 20 years cities will be 70 percent populate have the, of the population will be living and residing and working in cities worldwide but also um, in, in here in our own country um, do, do you see that those regulations, which are a comprehensive set of greenery, of natural spaces, of public natural spaces, um, and trying to imitate nature as much as possible for not just people's well-being, but for the environment as well, to cleanse it uh, much more than, <clears throat> I suppose, uh, all the pollutants that humans bring bring to um, cities and. <coughs> Have you heard of it about, about it in South Dublin? Uh, I know Tipperary have Tipperary Local Council have um, adapted it as well. So, 
I think that's one, one, one question or observation. The most doable, I suppose, uh, recycling or zero tolerance to can be now to plastic or polystyrene. Um, it's way up in the headlines. People are much more aware of it. The public in general have a, a have a guilt, I think, about it. And um, what's been shown on the TV is certainly, and the nature programmes and even the news uh, of the toxic seas has certainly had a significant impact on, on people's ability. I know the houses here have gone, you know, recycled world cups instead of plastic plastic, whatever. Um, plastic trying to phase it out and polystyrene as well uh, trying to phase it out um, as the material itself has been used for the construction of roads of some buildings as well. It's quicker to install, it's recyclable obviously and it's much more robust and durable than other construction materials. Is there anything on, is that legend or is there anything on the periphery that we might be able to uh, consider uses for this uh, plastic seas and mountains of plastic that we, we have to uh, figure what to do with uh, within not just this country but uh, wor worldwide. Um, especially, I suppose, we're thinking we're an island nation on the periphery of Europe. Um, we would have much more access to the pollutants in the sea and trying to uh, recoup them and and do some do something about them and maybe put them into some positive action. Uh, the point on Met, Met Aaron, I love Met Aaron and I think most of the country do and they listen to Met Aaron. It is about educating uh, the public. Um, a lot of the anachronisms that we use here just go over people's heads, but it's about educating the public. And I know you'd said that they were going to get a lot more research and study onto the floods and how to report that and whatever. I just think that perhaps in, in conjunction there would be an opportunity. I mean, the majority of people, maybe not the young, they don't watch the, the uh, state news, but a uh, majority of people would watch the news followed by weather and would there be a segment or a section within the Met Air and broadcast either on a daily or weekly, a, a very small section with just three points, um, three points for education of people and the positive as well as, as the negative that we're all destroyed ourselves and destroying the planet, but I think we need to use Met Air and, as an educational tool and as a propaganda is the not wrong word but as kind of an advertisement tool because people listen to that and most people ordinary people would not understand the, te the, the terms that we use in these committees or you use in you know the different organized state agencies that we have it kind of go it, they shut down it goes over their heads but something very simple clear concise and eye-catching um, but the positive must be uh, reinforced as, as much as the the need of uh, what, what else to do the fourth and final point is considering I suppose the 121 million that increase yesterday for landlords um, regarding the HAP and the RAS and just to get back to Deputy Pringle's point and I think uh, Senator O'Sullivan's point is that the rental accommodation so there's significant investment in it so the private market is is taking a, a significant I suppose chunk of what would, we would have had for social housing or affordable um, or cost, cost rental housing um, the bear rating, I understand, is a private matter for a private household, but given that the regulations were amended just, I think it was just June, just gone, or maybe last year, um, for rented units when um, they're in the receipt of either RAS or HAP, um, where the landlord, the, the, the emphasis is more now on the landlord's responsibility, they've taken away the rodent infestation being the, the tenant's responsibility, they, they, they've made the landlord responsible for fire alarms, um, laundry facilities, all of that. Could that be further amended to introduce a bear rating? Um, you don't want to scare off landlords in the climate that we're in, but they're getting a substantial amount of support, uh, if I, not just financial, from local authorities and surely they, they need to also have responsibility for the energy efficiency that they're offering tenants uh, in their homes. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Senator. Um, I know there's 
some issues there in relation to plastics that I know the Department of Communications, Climate Action and Environment may right. want to deal with, but I, maybe in the, in the marine space, maybe this department could deal with it. And um, just in relation to Met Air and Deputy Marcella Corkin Kennedy um, asked that question earlier. I'm just, I'm just, I don't want to yeah, repeat. No problem. Yeah. Uh, thank you, but that, though, I think you have answered those questions pretty well earlier. So okay. I can't deal with other questions. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Paul, do you want to just maybe talk about the, the sure. uh, space for wellbeing, please? Yeah. I think you know it's in line with the, the overall compact growth agenda that we've set out in, in, in the planning framework, and it comes down to really you know if, if we're expecting more people to live within our existing towns and cities and, and, and all of that, like we do have to be improving the livability as it's called and the quality of life, and I think the the old-fashioned kind of planning word is amenity, and that that's a word that comes up a lot, whether it's to do with planning applications or the amenities of a place. So you know, however it's described, it's just, it's just about things like providing um, you know good quality public spaces and, and routes for people to, to, to take exercise and to, to, to clear their head as, uh, as it is. So we've seen some great examples of that, for example, in the Docklands in Dublin along the, the, the River Keys, uh, but also some of the greenways, particularly the you know the more rural ones, but there's, oh. the, the, there's some urban ones on the way which are taking a bit longer. So th these are really important uh, for what we're talking about. And Certainly, it's one of the areas that um, th there's, there's two funds being, being put forward uh, or, or, or being assessed at the moment on foot of Project Ireland 2040, or four funds, I should say. Uh, two of those relate to um, urban and rural development. And just going back to something that, that uh, uh, Deputy uh, Pringle raised as well, the, 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 the point about encouraging people to live or to move into towns and villages by choice. Um, you know, the, the whole point of these funds is to make um, is to make a difference uh, in terms of it being being um, more attractive to, to, to develop and to, and to, to invest in um, uh, urban places, whether cities, towns or villages. So there's €2 billion Euros over 10 years committed for urban um, regeneration and €1 billion Euro over the same period for rural regeneration. And we're, we're considering mm. those bids in our own department in terms of the urban one, in the Department of Rural and Community Development for, 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 the, for the rural one. Uh, we've had, I think, 170, 180 bids as of last week at the closing date, and the Rural and Community Development Department have had um, nearly 300 uh, mm. bids. Um, and the sorts of things we'd be looking for are exactly what you've described in terms of, um, you know, investment in public spaces, for example, that, that can make places more attractive, but also can generate real development and, and, and things like water services uh, that can Im improve the capacity of small places or, 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 or whatever. So, um, you know, th th this is very much on, on the agenda because we recognise people, you know, won't just change their behaviour by choice. There has to be so, some degree of, 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 of prioritisation from, from, from an investment perspective. Will it be? Will it be? You know, kind of essential uh, when, when a planning application comes in. A essential criteria that they will provide. It, it can be difficult at the individual planning application level, whereby uh, you know one particular site or scheme has to fit in. It, it's, it's often better to capture it at the at the kind of the area planning level. Right. Uh, so uh, another of the kind of initiatives that, that that's come out of Project Ireland 2040 um, that, that that's happened is the establishment of the land development agency. And one of the um, you know the the, the 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 possibilities of having a development agency like that is that it will have that sort of overview in terms of you know master planning sites or site assembly, particularly starting with with, with, mm. with the state lands. Um, and, and the, you know, working with local authorities, of course, but, but there is that, that opportunity to to, to 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 see what what's required for an area on an area-wide basis, and, and, to, and to reflect that, um, you know, so that later on, then it, 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 it's it's already been been, been thought about uh, when, when individual sites are developed, because um, it, it can be, as we know, it can be. It, it can be a very considerable burden, uh, you know, on, on one particular applicant or site, um, if, if, it, if it's not spread in a, in a kind of equitable way. Sorry, would they, I understand that. So, so it could be one one site is going to have to adhere to and tick the boxes for the percentage of what that area needs in green spaces or water. Or so, would there be a percentage per planning application that they would have to kind of adhere to? 
um, which will well, spread it out. G generally, there, there, there's, there's planning standards that arise from the, yeah. the, the development plan. You know, whether it's 10% yeah. public open space, or mm -hmm. we're getting obviously we need to be a bit more sophisticated in terms of it's not just the allocation of some space. It's, it's, yeah. it's actively managed What's and usable that? space or a route that, that actually yeah. connects up with other things. But uh, I think it, it's always on, a, on an area by area basis or a, a case by case basis. Mm -hmm. It's very hard to, to generalise. And one of the problems we've had, and you know, we're very familiar with this from you know, parts of West Dublin where there's just yeah. been a standard and areas have just been left and lumped together and they've just become the kind of a big mass of, of, of green space with no particular purpose, you know, yeah. other than maybe some some pitches or something like that but mm -hmm. oftentimes it's not it's not it, it doesn't it's not it's not intensively used for for, for, it's for value. A lot, a lot so I think that that's what we're trying to get to particularly as we're talking about within our urban areas and mm -hmm. it, it applies you know on a city scale but also on, 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 a, on a smaller place scale too mm -hmm. very often you know smaller cities and or, or smaller um, towns and villages don't have dedicated parks or walking routes and it's, it's very common, obviously, to see people out walking along roads, which is, which is highly dangerous. So, uh, Do you want to come in on the other issue there in relation to BER rating? Or think yeah, uh, I think in relation to BER and, um, and having a, a potentially a, a minimum BER for rental properties, again, I think that would, that's something I think that could be considered once there's, once there's greater clarity around what level of supports and incentives will be put in place to bring, uh, bring properties up to use. If both weren't moving in tandem, you could uh, you could impose particular requirements. I mean, we've talked earlier it, uh, with Deputy Pringle that the, the retrofitting cost in the social housing stock could be between 20 and 30 thousand euros um, per unit. Um, and if we were to impose a requirement that gave rise to that level of cost, without there being some mechanism for the investment to be supported, we could actually end up taking units out of the rental stock, which might create a problem. So I think it's more about how the two might move forward together in, uh, in tandem. And we should legislate it for it soon, I think. No, just, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thank you. Thank Williams. you. Uh, thank you, Senator, uh, Senator Mulhern. Thanks, uh, thank Chairperson. You know, it's been a long meeting. Um, I'm just very mindful that, you know, as we're here discussing climate action, the last few days has seen terrible winds and rain, a tropical type storm in Mayo, Sligo and Donegal, and truly bad flooding, roads closed, um, and, um, you know, basically people discommoded, and one town in particular, across Malina, under the threat of flooding, and we're facing into another warning again. Mm -hmm. And there was two points that I just want to make on that. First of all, I think for me it underlines the importance of adaptation and the work that the OPW is undertaking in CFRAMS and even the work they've undertaken before that. And Cross Malina is actually one of the towns that's on the list which was listed in advance of CFRAMS and, and that particular body of work. Um, and, uh, but unfortunately they've been flooded in the recent past twice, so they have, and people have no insurance. And a lot of the areas that I find are flooded in Mayo are not areas where new development and floodplains has been given. These are all old parts of town which are built on rivers, as you have said, Mr McCarthy. So we are definitely seeing uh, a difference in the surge, uh, surges from rivers and, you know, the, the sort of weather conditions. So, I, I, you know, it's, it's very stark and just getting communications from people there and hopefully we've, we've reached surge point and people haven't been flooded, but obviously we're fearful going into the weekend what, what's going to happen there and some minor work schemes have been approved by the OPW in that particular town as they have in other areas until the major flood defence is built and hopefully they'll, they'll provide at least uh, protection up to a certain height so that's obviously available too because I know some members uh, spoke about it before. Um, just I suppose just a few points and questions. Um, we're facing into not achieving our 2020 targets and I think it would be fair to say that when we signed up to our Renewable Energy Directive commitments in 2009 uh, that uh, nobody would have thought that we were being over ambitious, for example in the area of electricity and renewable energy because we have the best wind resource. Uh, onshore, offshore, uh, we have we have wave, we have an abundance of uh, 
renewable resources in our country. And I think in order for us to go forward, we, you know, there needs to be an expose, and perhaps by somebody like yourself, Mr McCarthy, because I know in the last two years you're not so much involved in the, the climate side other than it's an interdepartmental thing. But up till this, it had fallen within your department. Like, why have we not achieved it? Compared to Europe, other European countries, we have better resources, but we never achieved it. And I'd like maybe you could give, offer some comment in relation to our planning process, uh, delays in planning, um, lack of guidance. I mean, how come it takes so long uh, for a review of the 2006 uh, wind farm guidelines? Um, and, and, you know, what's, what are we learning from this going forward? Uh, because it's for, definitely on the electricity side, um, which, um, you know, I think the planning has been an, an inherent problem there. And I'd also like to agree with Deputy Pringle. Uh, it just seems inordinate for us to get a, a marine spatial plan uh, uh, agreed and to be able to look at our marine resource uh, in a sustainable way but also as part of the solution for our re renewable energy needs and you know it's it's I think that the question is begging to be asked and it needs to be answered by people like yourself Mr McCarthy who are in the, the who, under whose stewardship a lot of this was, was happening and it's for enlightenment really uh, because a lot of people we get a you know and particularly government it, it, you know there's a lot of fingers pointed well, you know, you're not hitting this target and that target, but there's not a lot drilling down going as to, you know, different, uh, different moving parts, different pieces, community acceptance. I mean, you didn't have wind, the, the, the review of the wind farm guidelines uh, or the wind energy guidelines. I mean, this was promised to so many people and so many people have objected. I'd also like to know how many energy projects have been refused. And I'd like to maybe tie into that uh, when you're maybe addressing the whole planning system, uh, the whole issue of, of the Apple project in Athenry, which had uh, a piece, uh, obviously a renewable energy piece, which was the wind farm that was proposed with it. And there are questions, as I understand it, uh, that were to be referred, is it to the European Court of Justice, uh, in relation to uh, environmental concerns and, I do, you know, whether there be technicalities or what. And I have in the past asked for more information on this. And um, because we, we constantly seem to be running into, every time we try and develop in this country, is there seems to be problems with uh, environmental designation, and I have, I've sort of talked about this in, in different contexts, especially in relation to the building of infrastructure, SACs, um, etc., habitats, birds, all the rest. Uh, I note that uh, in your own constituency, in, in I think Derry Bryan Wind Farm, was built on a bog. I presume it was an SAC. I know they're saying that proper environmental studies weren't done, but I mean, you know where you're building a wind farm, maybe in a remote area where it's not interfering with people. You can't build it on an SAC, it would seem, etc., uh, etc. Et so just um, maybe some analysis about where it's all gone wrong, uh, when on the face of it, we should, be, we should be head of the class, especially in renewable electricity. In I, I want to welcome uh, the energy retrofits that have taken place in the social, uh, in the local authority housing stock. And I know that you said, over 64,000 houses, I think, in your presentation. And just to confirm, how much has that cost? And what, what uh, be your rating has that brought those houses to? And what, what, what be your level were those houses at? Um, I know you mentioned 20 to 30,000 there uh, in relation to, is that for deep retrofitting? I'm just wondering, it is. So that's going forward. Um, uh, in relation to the works that have been done in different local authority areas, um, I know that I think, Ms. Neri, you, you mentioned that it's basically the, the test in relation to whatever heating system or whatever you're doing in terms of works, say the local authority, is pretty much you're looking at the cost optimal technology. So it's whatever is more cost efficient. But what that has resulted in a county like my own in Mayo is that when councils went in, the council went in and did an energy retrofit which is very good. They also changed the heating system. And they changed the heating system to an upgraded oil boiler. So you basically have a whole load of people now who are locked into fossil fuel, into oil. And I could never understand why 
something more wasn't being done. Like we're talking about, uh, people are complaining that we're not levying more carbon taxes. But the, at the end of the day, you're talking about these people have no choice uh, in terms of switching their their heating system. Uh, they're really very much dependent on state policies and what, whether it's the local authority or what central government is doing for them. And I suggest that that's, that's a missed opportunity, and going forward, you know, the, those heating systems aren't going to be pulled out again. And there was another point, which I suppose was the most point that was made to me about a lot of people who had this work done, like people were glad to get new windows and all this sort of thing. But you had a situation where you had older people living in some of these houses, and their, their range was taken out, their fire was taken out, even with back boilers. They were no longer allowed solid fuel because it was, you know, wrong, it was fossil fuel, but they were allowed to have oil. And at the same time, from their point of view, they had more control over burning solid fuel in an open fire with a back boiler on it than they had with oil as far as they're concerned. And now I think you have people actually living in a form of fuel poverty because they're watching oil and is it going down and will they have enough oil. And I know, I fully appreciate that it, where people are on the basic incomes that they're getting a fuel allowance. But I don't think it's, 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 it's conducive to comfort to people who are older or sick and who actually need a lot more heating. I, I don't think it made any sense whatsoever. Um, and I just think that the, the department has presided over that and I think it's wrong. Um, just in relation to the, I suppose, I think as part of the, your, your presentation there, which is, I suppose, the nub of it, we like to think that as we're moving forward with energy efficiency and renewable energies, that it becomes a point at which, you know, it becomes more economically viable. And actually, you know, you invest in uh, uh, renewables, then at the end of the day, you're, over the longer term, you're going to pay less money, whether you're a business, whether you're a home, whether you're the state. And that, but there's an initial cost to begin with, whether you're changing your heating system, whether you're upgrading, etc. And it's the issue of cost I, I just wanted to look at. Um, you have said, and I understand from a previous committee meeting we had here, when I put the question uh, to, I forget who I put it to, maybe it was a department, a Minister Nocton's department, and I was told that you, you have a special committee or a group of people who are looking at uh, the cost of building houses to NZEP standard and that you, you will be better given us costings. And I see that you gave us a costing up from 0.7% to 4.2% additional cost on your social house. And I presume that that would also apply to the private, generally across, across the board. So I suppose, I just was wondering that, so for all the houses we're going to build, that, that's, that we need to build in this country to address our housing situation, that's going to be an additional cost on them. But I'm just wondering if you add on to that, because there hasn't been there haven't been that many houses built, say, in the last ten years. With changes in building regulations, I know there have been complaints in the past where even prior to the operation of the NZEP standard, that people are complaining because of new building regulations, which are not just dealing with energy performance, but are dealing with um, you know, the structural soundness and making sure we don't you know, have problems with block work and proper, that these, and, and that the procedures that we now require, that they have put additional cost. And I'm just wondering, in terms of costing on houses, that side of things, aside from you know the building materials and all the rest, what, what in reality, on top of your NZEP requirements, has the changes in building regulations, building standards in the last 10 years added to the cost of building your basic house? I wonder, would you have that information? And then, just going to the other issue on the NZEP, which is the major, um, uh, what is it, the major upgrading of a house? Well, what's the term you have for it? The major... Deep, deep retrofit? No, it's not no. the deep retrofit. If I'm doing a major renovation... Major renovations. Major renovations yeah. on a house. So we have a situation in the country where it's been identified, um, and you might confirm the number of units, that we have empty, vacant and derelict premises around the house, around the country. I know we have a lot of them in my own county, uh, which could be used for housing. And I'm just wondering, if we're to do that, and the, a lot of the government plans are to bring those into our system and that people can be housed, what is the cost 
going forward of a major renovation on those second-hand properties. I appreciate it can vary because depending on the state of the properties. But just to give you an example, uh, at the most recent census in Mayo, 24% of our houses were deemed empty. And a lot of them, really there's been no construction since, I suppose, there wasn't even much construction going on in 2010. Uh, so we can say that a lot of these houses are not to a high energy rating standard. So, you know, what extra cost are you talking about that might account for the fact that you have all these schemes now uh, on the go, or, or the minister has schemes, you know, the lease and renew and lease and repair and, and buy and renew and all this, and there doesn't seem to be much of a take up. Like, are we really factoring in the real cost of renovating properties? Yes. I might put those questions because there's an awful lot there. <laughs> Take a notes in any order you wish. Um, okay. Um, where do I start? Uh, wind guidelines, absolutely. We would love to have had the wind guidelines uh, put in place, uh, the revised wind guidelines put in place a long time ago. The 26, 20, 2006 guidelines remain remain in place. Um, obviously, there have been there's there's an energy there's an energy policy. Um, Piece, and there's a planning piece, and trying to reconcile those into a new set of guidelines has been hugely difficult. Um, but we're just, and then just about as we as we got to that point, um, I think you forget um, Deputy, Deputy Pringles, Deputy Stanley, actually, I think earlier on, um, on the um, uh, we were hit with a European Court of Ju not we were, but a European Court of Justice judgment in a I think it was either a Belgian or a Dutch case. Um, uh, was handed down, which meant that we then had to go through a strategic environmental assessment process on them. We will be that uh, preparation of that SEA report is now pretty much done, so we will be starting the consultation on those in the next few weeks. Um, out to consultation for eight weeks, and we'll be able to finalise those in early uh, in early 20 uh, early 2019. Um, in terms of uh, you mentioned renewable uh, electricity, uh, and again, uh, I don't have the the, the data on uh, on this. Um, and it may have arisen when when uh, Dennis Nocton's department were in here. But um, my recollection is that we were uh, um, we had made very significant progress towards uh, towards target in terms of our level of renewable uh, renewable electricity generation is there. I don't have the I don't have the figures in relation to it but um, notwithstanding all of the issues that have uh, that have arisen um, I think it is an area where there has been a fair amount of uh, a fair amount of progress made over the last uh, over the last decade um, refusals as well so you know Absolutely, and of, uh, you have the numbers uh, I don't have numbers in relation to in relation to particular projects, but I mean you can see the um, not so much the numbers of uh, of projects, but you can see the capacity and the extent to which on a and I think the the electricity people track this virtually on a daily basis, the extent to which renewable electricity is actually its composition of uh, of the overall uh, electricity generation in any given day, and you you can see over time that curve has gone up uh, has gone up quite. Oh, we're uh, still going to miss our target. Quite, by the uh, quite significantly that uh, that may well be the uh, may well be the case and I suppose uh, one of you, you you asked a general question and um, uh, I'll, I'll venture into this territory even though uh, uh, for fear of, uh, uh, of of not trying to uh, not trying to address it I mean we've one of the things I know from my from my own experience uh, previously as I say now that's gone back a number of years ago so um, uh, you'd have to take it with that uh, with that health warning. Obviously, the emissions, the carbon emissions, uh, some of them are dealt with under the emissions trading system. Some of them are dealt with through outside of that system through uh, through domestic programmes. I suppose the, the the thing that has made Ireland's emissions profile sort of stand out uh, and stand out very much apart from uh, many other EU countries is uh, the extent of emissions from agriculture. And again, I think you'll have. Department of Agriculture coming in, and some, but that is, that is a that is a big challenge for Ireland, and I think it's from memory. I think it's probably only Denmark that has a non-emissions trading um, uh, emissions profile um, that would see agriculture accounting for anything near the share of emissions that it counts uh, it counts for here. Um, so that is that is an issue that obviously has impacted on uh, on our uh, capacity to uh, to deal with the. Um, 
and to, to work towards our emissions uh, emissions target. But again, as I say, um, you'll hear from experts in agriculture who who will talk to you in relation to the issues in uh, in that Mr. space. Mr. McCarthy, I'm, I'm really asking about the, our electricity, our renewable electricity targets, as opposed to our emissions at this juncture, which I understand they're intertwined. But in fairness, I'm asking you about us, our commitments that were given in 2009 that we are not going to achieve, notwithstanding have the best resources. So you know the the, the emissions. It's a balancing thing, but you have to address the issue around electricity, transport, heat. But I'm asking you about electricity because invariably there's problems with the planning system and you have mentioned yourself there about the wind and the review of the wind energy guidelines that have been so slow. And just another point, you mentioned about a strategic environmental assessment. I suppose this is nearly going into something else, but it is disappointing to see the number of planning applications that are refused on environmental grounds because of, in many cases, a technicality that uh, whether whatsoever an appropriate assessment hasn't been done the right way, a strategic environmental assessment hasn't been done. You know, it, it's, it seems to be cropping up on a regular basis. So are we, are we on top of that? Some of those questions are for the Department of Communications, Climate Action and Environment, and if they are, that's well, fine. Some of the, it's yeah. the planning some, ones I'm interested yeah. in. Okay, just the planning. Mm -hmm. Well, the planning ones. I've spoken. Department. I've spoken yeah. about the the planning guide, the wind guidelines, and where we are uh, where we are on uh, on those. Um, I think the planning process has given planning permission for a very significant quantum of. Um, uh, of wind energy infrastructure, and as I say, that can be seen from. I don't have the data. I don't look after electricity, but I think the the TK people would certainly have the data to be able to show the extent to which uh, renewable energy has uh, has increased its contribution towards the overall electricity generating profile. From our point of view, our uh, our key requirement now is to get the wind energy guidelines finalised so that the planning process has the most up-to-date set of guidelines that it needs in order to be able to deal with applications as they as they continue to uh, as they continue to come in. But air grid will be coming before us as well, just on that. Sorry, well. sir? Air grid will be coming before okay. our committee as well. So I know there's some questions you cannot answer there, but what, whatever you can, I'll let you just give your answers there without interruption. Okay. Um, um, yeah. Sorry, Chair, just to clarify, I, I do totally appreciate and acknowledge that uh, Mr McCarthy is not dealing with the, the, the energy and the climate action now other than as part of the interdepartmental, but he was for several, several years and over the period that I'm referring to. So I, I would, I mean, we're here to reflect and decide how yeah. we're going to go forward. Yeah. And I just, you know, I was interested to know, you know, Key, key reasons why we haven't, we're not, we're not hitting our targets. Okay. I, I'll let Mr. McCarthy just answer all those questions, just the rest of them, without any interruption before I bring in Deputy Ryan. If can, I don't mean that that way, no, I'm just no, conscious of fine. time. Senator, that's all. Thank you. Okay. Um, sorry, just to move on then to the, um, you talked about uh, vacancy, um, uh, Senator, um, and I suppose the figures that we have, insofar as there, there are national figures, they would have been from the 2016 census. Um, and the, the, the headline figure that w was there in relation to vacancy. But we've done a fair bit of drilling down into that. You can obviously point, and I can point to my own uh, home situation in Cork. Um, there are parts of the country, certainly, where vacancy continues to be a, uh, a significant issue. But it was we've, we've tried to well, we've tried to do a number of things. One, we've tried to introduce schemes, and you've mentioned a few of them, to try to bring some of those vacant properties back into use. So, for example, in the repair and leasing scheme, we would allow for up to I think it's 40,000 in terms of uh, of capital funding to repair a property, and then we would lease it for a minimum of uh, a minimum of five years. Um, and on buy and renew, I think we're more flexible because in reality, on a buy and renew property, you'll probably be paying little enough, uh, or certainly comparatively less, because the property is in such bad nick, and the bulk of the money then would actually go into the uh, go into the into the renovation. But we are at the moment uh, with a number of local authorities; uh, they actually have people out on the ground. Um, doing surveys in areas that the census would have suggested were vacancy hotspots, and uh, Fingal would be one of them, Waterford is, is another, and the information that is coming back is that the actual level of vacancy now in those areas that have been looked at is massively less than what the census would have suggested. And I think it's important that the census figures that we bear in mind, that they, when they, when they counted um, vacancy, 
that uh, they included properties that were sort of up for sale and up for rent and were kind of just turning over in the normal uh, in the normal market. Um, we have established a, um, a vacancy office in the local government system, which is run uh, really out of uh, out of Mayo in terms of trying to promote uh, amongst property owners the fact that we do have funding available to try to bring vacant properties back into use and to provide a web facility where there are vacant properties that people can actually log them, notify them to the local authority, and they can be uh, they can be investigated um, uh, to to bring them back in. But again, it's it's trying to I suppose harness the the vacancy potential with the willingness of owners and the availability of capital to actually make all of that gel together and actually bring a unit back into uh, into use. Yeah, that's housing, which is obviously relevant. But I'm asking how much is it going to cost on average, or what is the price range to bring? houses to deep retrofit to bring them to NZ standard on a major renovation. Now when we were here before I remember, uh, I can't remember who gave us the, the evidence, but it was suggested at one point that maybe it was even SEAI, it could be anything from 40,000 to 70,000 on a house. So I'm just wondering from your own uh, experts that came together to tell us the additional cost on a new build, what will it be on average on an existing property? Our, uh, our knowledge in relation to existing properties is really down to our knowledge of the uh, of the social housing stock, and I suppose it would be when you look at what people might talk about in terms of private housing, you'd be going in really to to do a pr it property by property, whereas with social housing, our retrofitting we would go in and we would do a, 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 if you like an estate or at least a, a road at a time, so there'd be economies of scale that you could get from that. Our uh, where our analysis is at this stage would suggest that we're somewhere between. 20 and 30,000 for the deep retrofit on the social housing stock. But that, as I say, does take account of the economies of scale that you could actually realise by virtue of doing a large number of units together. So the, the profile that you might have gotten from SEAI in relation to individual houses uh, might, be, uh, might be different from that. I'll answer the rest of the questions if there are any remaining. Are there, or do you feel... Um, I had asked about the cost of changes in the building regulations since you know, in the past number of years, aside from the energy performance side, has placed on the cost of a house. I might ask maybe Sarah just to, to say a few words on that, Senator. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, I, suppose I don't have the accumulative cost um, uh, uh, here at the moment, but at, every time we change the building regulations, we do a regulatory impact assessment. We're very conscious of cost, and I suppose the areas that we cover in the building regulations are really around the health and safety of people in or around buildings. So just um, to give you an example of some of the things that we would have done in the last 10 years was fire safety in dwelling houses, sound between houses, proper ventilation in houses, the introduction of carbon monoxide alarms, um, uh, standards for flues from heating systems, uh, wastewater treatment systems. They are, they are basic uh, functional requirements of buildings and homes in the interest of um, safety and health. We're very conscious of, of costs when we carry it out and as I said we do a regulatory impact assessment on each one showing the extra or additional costs, if any, and in some cases it's, it's very... Is there a that, that you could send? Or is that so they're all on our website. Oh, right. They are all publicly available. Okay. And publicly consulted on for a period of three months each time. Costs or your... Both. Or both? Both. Okay. And then you... Sure. There was one thing you didn't answer, which is about the rationale for uh, replacing, you know, when, you're, you're, when the local authority was doing an energy refit and replacing the heating system, is putting in, a, a has been for quite a while, putting in uh, upgraded oil boilers. I suppose the, um, and Sean, if you want to come in on any of this, the, the, uh, the, in terms of the social housing retrofit, uh, as Jan has explained, there was a, uh, the first phase was around attic insulation and, and sort of uh, either cavity fill or internal insulation, uh, which were uh, kind of simple and basic measures. Um, phase two is a, is a deeper retrofit uh, and uh, will involve heating systems. I suppose important where you're go when you're changing a heating system to something um, like for example a heat pump that you have that uh, that uh, better fabric insulation so it would really only be suitable when you're going hand in hand with a better energy performing building uh, with a, you know a lower heat demand 
Um, so there may have been specific situations for the case that you're talking about. It's why not a case, it's universally every house that was where the heating system was replaced. Because the reason I would be so familiar with it, so many people were very disappointed that they lost their back boiler and that they lost control and that they were all just given oil fired central heating systems. Well, which as didn't make in the rollout of phase two, we'd be uh, very keen to see that the fabric, um, the fabric is improved to lower the energy uh, demand in the first place and then. Uh, put in a heating system that's uh, the, the best possible option in that and we will be encouraging heat pumps in, in that regard um, and that phase hasn't fully launched yet so I suppose the uh Thank you. Did you want to come in, Mr. Armstrong? Are you okay? No, yeah, okay. Thank you. Okay, yeah, thanks, thank you. I'm thank going to bring you. in Deputy Ryan. I know Deputy Pringle, you did point of clarification, but I might bring you in at the end. That's okay. Deputy Ryan. Thank you very much indeed, Chair. Um, Mr. McCarthy, uh, uh, um, you, there was indeed a, a strategic environmental assessment carried out on the National Planning Framework. I think we made a submission ourselves. Um, but why was it that there was no strategic environmental assessment done of the National Development Plan? Um, as I understand it, and Paul, you can you can uh, correct me on this. As I understand it, uh, the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform uh, formed the view that it wasn't required. Because it, it's a um, it's a, a, a financial or budgetary framework, um, they were satisfied that it did not require SEA um, under the, the European directives. Do you think the European institutions will accept that when they come to meet us and look at what's happening in our climate approach? That's, uh, I suppose, that, 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 the, the, as I said, the, the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform are satisfied with that. They have, I think, they have legal advice to back that up. So, I, you know, that, that's a matter for for the uh, European institutions to determine themselves. In your, own, in your own strategic environmental report, you recognised that the nature of yours was strategic and broad objectives, therefore it wasn't a project level, which the National Planning Framework was. You get a completely different context if you go for a project level, which the National Development Plan is. Um, and I think the European institutions aren't going to accept it because the EPA, three months after the National Planning Framework was agreed, publicly acknowledged that they haven't the first faintest idea what the climate implica Im implications of it were. And I think any assessment they've since done, or that's coming out, is that it will see an increase in emissions rather than a reduction in emissions in key sectors. Transport and agriculture emissions are forecast to rise. And we're going into a European negotiation process where we have to cut them at least 30, 40%. And I think in that context, the European institutions are going to look to see we've got this whole process wrong again. We got it wrong in the early part of the last decade when our strategic planning framework was completely divorced from the National Development Plan at that time, and the exact same thing has happened again. Would you not agree there's a real divergence between the National Planning Framework and the National Development Plan in terms of our environmental results, our objectives? The one, the planning framework is, is in my mind, the right track. The National Planning Framework, the National Development Plan ignored it in the end. Yeah, do you want comments on that, Deputy? Yeah. If you want to comment on it, or if it's I, I don't. Uh, I don't believe so, Deputy. I think there was a, there was a huge amount of uh, collaboration and engagement um, right across government as part of the process of doing the, both the NPF and the uh, and the National Development Plan. Obviously, when it comes to the rollout of individual uh, individual uh, projects under the National Development Plan, um, uh, the, I suppose the the proof will be in the will be in the pudding at uh, at that stage. But I mean, the NPF is very clearly uh, as you've as you've acknowledged is very clearly in the space of urban compact uh, urban compact growth where we can make better use of existing services better use of public uh, public transport and basically better use of uh, of land and i think uh, from the engagement that we've had and the engagement across government uh, as part of the process of doing the two documents together we think the ndp and the npf are very closely aligned can I an example why i don't agree with that a couple of examples first comes from this room we had transport infrastructure ireland into the transport committee and the rest what was their key transport objectives in terms of tackling gridlock in Dublin? And their answer was, we're going to widen the N11, we're going to widen the N7, we're going to widen the N6, we're going to widen the N4, widen the N3, widen the N2, all allowing for greater long-distance commuter traffic into Dublin, despite Dublin being gridlocked. How does that fit in with the national planning framework objectives of compact development? Um, well, I suppose the, the NPF's compact urban growth um, uh, thrust is dependent on uh, and will be realised through 
new housing development taking place in the areas that have been targeted for it and the, the proportions, for example, that we, we aim to achieve within the, uh, within the M50, for example, in, uh, in Dublin. So if, if we can get that piece right and we get that carried through to the spatial economic strategies and into the city and county development plans, then the housing development, if that takes place in the right, uh, in the right locations, in proximity to urban, uh, urban centres where economic activity is happening, then that will, that think, will achieve... Do you think this motorway is going to help expansion, extension and the approach roads to Dublin is going to help that? Do I think it's going to help the... Compact development of Dublin, the centre, and the development of the right location? Well, I mean, the, the um, roads development programme is in, is in part, to, to my knowledge, is to address existing, existing congestion problems, um, uh, in, in some respect at least. But, I mean, whether, a, whether motorways are or aren't built... If we can get the residential development and the associated um, uh, services that are required to support it in place in the right locations, that is going to be a fundamental driver of what the NPF seeks to achieve. Do you think the National, plan, the National Development Plan will achieve the emissions reductions that we know we have to achieve within the European Shared Responsibility for 2030 and the 2050? I think the, uh, you, that's probably a question that um, uh, I think our, our colleagues in, in Decay would be better placed to answer, but I think we're satisfied from the engagement that we have had as part of the process of preparing the NPF that the NDP is aligned to support what the NPF seeks to achieve in a way that it hasn't been before. Can I explain to you why I think that's utterly wrong? Um, we've heard the Minister for non-stop going on about he's cornered £23 billion of spending. 13 of it is existing investment by ESB Airgrid, which they happen every year on grid investment. That's, that would have happened anyway. And in the retrofitted buildings, which should be the most successful, the most carbon efficient reduction, the most first thing we do, there's a three billion figure for the next 10 years, I think, isn't it? What you said here today when you were asked a question, um, how much of that social housing retrofit you would do you said it would depend on the money. In other words, it's dependent on the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform. How many of those 40,000 houses you cited at the cost, as Deputy Pringle discovered, of about a billion, if there were 30 grand, 25, 30 grand to deep retrofit each, how much would the, would the carbon saving from, that, from those 40,000 houses being retrofitted? I don't have that calculation with me. How come we're not, if we're going to face the European Commission in a couple of months' time, where we have a 50 million tonne at least shortfall, we do have those calculations, and that actually rather than going to finance our Department of Public Expenditure Reform begging for money, we're going saying, here's our project, 40,000 houses, we'll save X amount of carbon, this is the cheapest carbon saving that you can achieve to meet this agreed, treaty-based European institution signed off at every level, rather than going cap in hand, as we, are, we heard here today to Department of Public Expenditure and Reform, please give us some money. Why don't we base this, or hope, if the National Development Plan was based around climate objectives, you'd know that figure, you would be in a much more powerful position with the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform. How come that level of engagement between the departments is not happening? Well, I think, um, I mean, the point that I was making in relation to how quickly the retrofitting exercise will be completed, it is ultimately down to um, uh, the, the level of financial resources that are made available. But that's not to say that in going looking for those resources, that of course we wouldn't marshal all of the, the, the positive impacts that would flow from uh, the retrofitting programme, not just in terms of carbon, uh, carbon emissions, but also in terms of health, uh, and this is a difficult area to try to quantify, but there are health and comfort benefits. How uh, much that of that three, three billion are you going to get? Well, I can't tell the, I can't tell the future, but um, we will certainly be, as we move on and finalise our arrangements for phase two, we will certainly be pressing strongly for as significant a programme of investment as we can possibly get in order to deliver the retrofitting programme as quickly as we possibly How can. How did we sign off on a national development plan and put a three billion figure down and we didn't know where the money was going and what the carbon abatement or reduction would be from it? How come that wasn't done as part of the national development plan process? Within the, the three billion um, obviously that is targeted towards retrofitting generally. 
we will and public funding um, uh, is something that for, for the public housing stock that we will be looking to prioritize as part of the distribution of that uh, of that uh, overall pot of money but it is ultimately going to be it is ultimately going to be a as is always the case it is ultimately going to be a, a fight for uh, a fight for resources marshalling the arguments that can be brought to bear in terms of what the resources will actually achieve in climate in health and in other terms we've just got the department pk's um, sorry, that's not it. We just got their submission, the public consultation paper on um, the writing of the National Energy and Climate Action Plan, which is the first draft has to be done by the end of the year. I'll have to be saying, first read, it's unintelligible, and I think God help any person, member of the public, trying to make a submission on it. But surely, as part of this process, you will have to have an answer to that question, and indeed it might not be, I don't think it'll be a three billion figure, I think it needs to be a multiple of that. Because we're facing 600 million euro fines a year at least for the carbon gap we're facing. You surely in the retrofitting of public buildings, John Fitzgerald suggested it should be five billion spent on social housing alone. Our climate reputation increasing after the budget yesterday is in a state of tatters. Our government's outlook and management of it is really open to question now. Surely you'll have to answer to some, surely you're going to your colleagues by Christmas and saying, here's our contribution to the 50 million. If we did not, not 40,000 houses, if we did 100,000 houses, this is the amount of carbon we'd save, this is the amount of cost, this is the amount of fuel poverty we would reduce. Why aren't you doing that as part of this process? Well, I suppose we, I mean, we are doing uh, we are doing a lot as part of this uh, this process in terms of what we're doing in terms of building regulations. So that we're actually this is actually these are new performance requirements that we're going to be uh, we're going to be introducing that will apply across housing developments generally, and will apply across major major renovations. The key piece, uh, and this arose in the in the conversation earlier, is. In the case of um, the, the stock of, uh, of housing, we obviously have the public housing stock and we're moving, as I say, into phase two, where we're going to be looking to, at minimum, deal with those 40,000 oldest houses at a particular cost, as we understand at this point in time. But the key piece is going to be how the, um, the remaining resources are going to be deployed in order to bring the balance of the, of the, the private housing stock okay. into, into a better place. In, I, I'm afraid I'm with Mary Donnelly on the terms of um, continuous fossil fuel heating. I'm with her in terms of it makes sense to do it now. I heard the arguments from the department here today. We, we, we do it to keep supply of houses going and to bring competition. I don't think we need competition from gas and oil. I think we have to stop gas and oil now. But on a separate question, you, you write in your, in your speech about the part L, the um, costing of everything, the uh, cost optimal levels. What's the cost of carbon that you're working on in that or in any other of the work you're doing? Do you want to say you've got the... Yeah, so um, we took, um, we, we have uh, done our cost optimal study. Um, we took our forecasts from the SEAI, SEAI uh, cost of carbon. Um, I think it's a 15 year forecast uh, that they gave us. Um, that starts off at around the 20 euro per kilo per, per tonne and increases uh, year on year. And then um, we also did a 2% uh, sensitivity on it. So as well as running it at the baseline uh, that SEAI, uh, uh, SEAI's forecast, we also increased it 2% year on year. So at the end of 30 years, there's a 60% increase on your, the SEAI. Fit. And what's your discount rate? Our discount rate, so we did um, a 3% discount rate. We did it from a societal and a financial perspective. So we did a 3% discount rate and a 5% discount rate from the societal perspective. And that's the perspective we use to set the building regulations. And we also did a, a 7% and a 10% discount rate from a financial uh, perspective to inform us, to inform the, the, the the analysis, but we decided that um, the 5% discount rate was the more appropriate discount rate to set our performance requirements on because we want to look at it from a societal perspective and that gives a better uh, benefit to be future savings. And were they the same broad costs of carbon that were applied in the National Development Plan in terms of signing off on that? Um, so I'm not, I wasn't involved in the development of the National Development Plan, but these were the official forecasts from SEAI. Okay. And do you, in the part L regulations, you're saying your cost, look at the capital cost up front and the fuel cost, or the running costs, 
Do you include the cost of carbon in all the calculations? In so from a societal perspective, we do include the cost of carbon, and from a financial perspective, we don't include the cost of carbon. But we used the societal perspective to set our performance requirements. Okay. Um, I have one other question, if I can, so I uh, can encourage it, just, or, uh, just to get my, my head around it. Um, do you accept, I'm being critical here, and since I'm asking teasing questions, because there are teasing questions to be asked, do you accept my analysis, my assessment, of all the modelling that shows we're 100 million tonnes short between, for the next decade in our carbon um, emissions, and that we will have to make up that gap? I think, I, for in terms of uh, in terms of gap, um, deputy, I would rely on the, the EPA do an annual uh, an annual profile in relation to uh, in relation to that. I don't know whether the figures that you're you're quoting relate uh, exactly to that, but I mean they do go through a very uh, a very uh, precise uh, annual exercise. So um, I think the, the figures in terms of the gap are, are clearly identified in that. And and so how is it that the public service? is not engaged in the process. You're not coming forward. I've had three Secretary Generals here now, and not one of you have actually seemed to be engaged in the process of closing that gap, in recognising that a national development plan isn't good enough, that a national mitigation plan won't do it, that the scale of ambition is a multiple of what we need to be doing. Why is it that I've had three sector, we've had three Secretary Generals here now who have refused to recognise that reality? Um, well, I think in terms of closing the uh, closing the gap, uh, obviously our further move towards INZEB is uh, an important piece in terms of closing the uh, closing the gap. Our um, intention to move on to a phase two of retrofitting of the social housing stock is an important step in closing the uh, closing the gap, and we are working with as part of the process that I think the uh, Department of uh, of Climate Action mentioned to you about the process that they are engaging in to look at basically what are the range of options that government is going to have to uh, choose from in order to ensure that the gap is actually bridged. Just last question. If I what were you given in the budget yesterday for the next phase of the social housing retrofit, deep retrofits? I think are we, is it 25 million we're working for for next 20, year? 25 million? Yep. Now we don't know because you don't know, you couldn't give me the figure of what the actual emission savings would be, but I'm fairly sure if we go on that trajectory to meeting the 2030 target, and when I know what's happening, there's not a single public transport being built this year or next year. Um, our transport emissions are rising 4% per annum, our agricultural emissions are rising, it's rather rising everywhere. Improving the NZ building standards is not going to deliver the scale of emissions reduction that would see your department contributing to getting this country out of a hole, which is the 600 million euro fines we're facing, and Europe's not going to let us off this, on this one. A 25 million is not enough. If it, if it had been 250 million, you'd say, okay, we're on track. Would you not accept that, that we, we have to be looking at a tenfold increase in ambition if we're going to be serious about closing that gap? Absolutely. I think we've, as I mentioned earlier, we're migrating from phase one, which was a much lower cost um, uh, programme, into phase two, where I think I've acknowledged very clearly the costs are going, to be, are going to be more. So I would expect, according as our capital ceiling increases in the years after 2019, that you will see that figure uh, rising so that we can accelerate the, the momentum in the, in the phase two programme. Um, apart from phase two and apart from INZEB, um, obviously the, the national planning framework is designed at a very high level to actually be the strategic driver to underpin a lot of the progress that, yes, we will have to rely on other departments to actually deliver on, but if we didn't have that as a strategic planning framework, um, I think our challenge in terms of climate change would be, would be significantly greater. The last point, if I can, uh, Kaila, because just the reason I'm interested in that figure, I, I, what I've been trying to get in advance of these commission meetings is for departments to come in advance and say, here is our additional projects that would help close the gap. And then we debate those and think, which are the better ones? So we can compare, contrast, which is the most economic, which is the best social benefits, and so on. None of the departments have done that yet. The next one, whoever Secretary General is next up, needs to come in saying, given we're in this process with the European National Energy and Climate Action Plan, given we're short and given we have to have additional measures, here's what they are. If you could, in writing, just following up for this commission, 
present analysis in written form as to what the emissions reductions would be from a much bigger, or from the current planned, but even a scaled up retrofit of deep scale of deep buildings and a rough but cost abatement curve in terms of what it's going to cost us, benefit us, and or what's going to cost. I bet you it's going to be the winning project. I bet you you'd scoop the pot. So your department should be doing it as a because you're going to be a better, pro but it should be carbon-led, not just for Department of Public Expenditure and Reform. And the last point, just the reason why I was very keen on that memo from the joint the forum you have with the Department of Deeper and other departments on the implementation of the National Development Plan is Mary Donnelly from the European Commission recommended that there be some sort of monthly meeting of top senior civil servants on this climate, climate issue and that they would report to government every month, quarterly reports, much more significant reports. It seems to me we have close to that structure in place with this forum that you have, but it needs to realise that the national planning framework needs to completely change, the national development plan rather, needs to completely change and really implement what was set out as, a, as an objective of the national planning framework, which the current national planning, na national development plan does not do. Turn that forum into a national development plan forum into a national climate forum where senior civil servants, because this is the big, big game for the public service. If you do not achieve this, this, this turnaround in our whole approach, I think Europe will roast you. Thank you. Maybe a final comment there. Deputy Pringle, did you have a question of clarification you wanted to make now? Just yeah, was basically one of the questions I asked earlier on wasn't answered. And Sorry, yeah. I, I wanted to just go back on it because uh, yeah. I think it's important. It's in relation to the part L of the planning regulations. And um, you've, you've outlined previously that they've been in, in gestation for 10 years and it's, it's been well flagged that these are happening and that they're. But, and in an examination of Donegal County Council's planning uh, website yesterday, out of nine applications covering 11 houses, 10 of those houses were for in breach of the, the regulations. So I wonder how that can be. Okay. So we're to yeah, okay. Uh, uh, what, I, what I speculate, I suppose, is that um, so the planning process isn't the building control process, it's post-planning that uh, they, when the building commencement notice is, is submitted, that's when all the compliance pieces are submitted. So um, that's when you'd have a deep calculation, which is the way of showing compliance uh, with part L of the building regulations. Uh, all, all the 12 aspects of the building regulations are uh, confirmed at that point as to how they comply, and, and like that is a more detailed. Um more shocking than I thought, to tell you the truth. So, I, just to, uh, maybe a few clarifications. There is a kind of a perception out there that Parcel prevents the installation of, of fireplaces and chimneys. If you put in an underground vent with a stove, you can still install a stove in a building with a chimney, and it has a marginal effect on the energy performance of the building, which can be compensated by other elements of the building. So, it is possible, and just, you know, this is some, something you hear kind of casually is that you. Partel prevents the installation of chimneys and the installation of fires. That's not correct. It can still be in, installed as a secondary heating source in the building. Um, the Central St Statistics Office, in their analysis of BER data for new buildings, uh, have shown, uh, published regularly um, that 98% of new dwellings achieve an A rating, which is uh, roughly uh, compliance with Partel. So in the analysis of BER statistics, we're shown that 98% of dwellings are achieving an A, a rating. Uh, in a lot of one-off houses, which may or may not have been what, what you were looking at, we're aware that um, heat pumps have increased in the installation. Heat pumps obviously don't need chimneys, and they can be installed as the primary heat. They don't need fires either. They don't need fires. Either. They don't need fires. Like, no, no, but, but people, people in, install stoves for different reasons. You know, not always to heat the house. There's aesthetic reasons. People, people like, from a cultural perspective, to have a fireplace in their house quite so, often. You know? So having a fireplace in your house means you can still comply with all the regulations and you can, be, and you can build a, a part B 
the eve. Absolutely. If you if you if you install it with an underground vent that has a direct uh, vented air supply um, to the to the stove that doesn't have to take that you don't have a wall vent in the dwelling, drawing cold air into the dwelling. You have two underground pipes connected to your dwelling, so that cold air isn't coming into the dwelling anymore. It's just going into the bottom of the stove and being channeled up the chimney and providing combustion for the fire. So it is possible to install the stove. Um, would, the, would those houses be about that standard, do you think? I, I would think so, yeah. I, I, I would think actually um, in, in the self-build uh, situation, I think people can be more conscious of energy efficiency uh, maybe than, than in other sectors of the economy. But I think, I think the CSO statistics are really, you know, established that 98% of dwellings are being built to an A rating. And I think there's one other uh, fact that's important as well. You know, we're, dry, we're, we're, we're pushing this uh, uh, with, with our regulatory requirements, but I, I think um, it's clear from the, the feedback we're getting, people are finding uh, uh, built dwellings built to new, dwell to new regulations are much more comfortable. Um, we've heard stories of in, in the Tipperary Energy Agency super homes of uh, people saying that their uh, chests have improved, oh, yeah. that they no longer need to take medication. I agree totally with and, what you're saying. And no, then just the one final point. So, you know, it's not all about the hard facts. You know, there's the soft facts as well. But um, on the hard side then, you know, if you're to talk about money, the ESRI have published a, a paper um, and they state that the increase in value of a property from a D rating to an A rating uh, increases the value of a property from 9% and it's been reported out in the property sections of the newspapers now that um, A rated dwellings are driving a demand for, for, for new dwellings. So there, there, there's a lot, I, the, stati the statistics are telling us that 98% of dwellings are being uh, built to the standards. Um, just an analysis of chimneys won't tell you whether it complies or not. Um, you need to have the, the, the final uh, documentation and there's a lot of softer benefits that are pulling the market towards a rate of 12 and do you, well. do you check just, that out? I just want to, to, yeah. just want to know, do you check that as a department, do you check the statistics and stuff they got there? Like? So, so the CSO analyses the uh, BER database on a quarterly basis and um, you can be added to the email list and re receive that report Great. every three months and you'll see uh, the improvements in dwellings uh, in that Thank report you. every three months. Thank you very much, I know it's been a very long session, do you have any concluding comments? Uh, I think we've been you're, you're happy, yeah. We've thank you very much. Yeah, thank, yeah. You. thank you very much for your engagement and thank you to all the members. I know it's been a long session. So, uh, Mr. McCarthy and all your officials, thank you for coming to our meeting. So, the next meeting of the Joint Committee is on the uh, 18th of October at 1.45 pm. So, this meeting is adjourned until then. Thank you. Thank you.